Well, hello, everybody. This is Tim Green with Rattle Magazine. And welcome to Rattlecast number 160. So glad you could join me. Today's guest is Jessie Randall. She'll be here in just a moment. But before we begin, I should say that Rattle is a publication of the Rattle Foundation, a 501c3 nonprofit working to promote the practice of poetry. We've been in continuous publication since 1995 and are unaffiliated with any other organization. We just do this because we love poetry, and I know you do too. So please do click the like button and share. Make sure you're subscribed. Ring the bell for notifications, leave reviews on iTunes, whatever you can do to help spread poetry around the internet so the algorithms like us as much as you do. Uh, That would be greatly appreciated. Um, Now, we like to start with Poets Respond, and neither of the poets this week could be with us today. Um, Lisa Maloma um, is is an attorney and is working a case right now, I guess. And um, um, Janice Soderling, who has tomorrow's poem, is um, in Sweden, and the timing doesn't work quite right. But we will take a look at both these poems first. So um, Sunday's poem was Lonely by Lisa Maloma. And uh, here's, a take, here's a peek at the poem. And um, here's what Lisa had to say. Scroll down. So this is, um, as of today, Kenya inaugurated uh, William Ruto as president in a peaceful transfer of power that was notable because Ken- of Kenya's history of post-election violence. Um, I'm still moody, though is what Lisa says. And that inspired this poem called Lonely. And let's take a look at it. We'll have Lisa read it in her own words. And I'll take my face off the screen because you don't need to see me. Here's uh, Lisa reading her poem, Lonely. Lonely. On the drive home, mom calls and you resent her for doing it. Answer anyway. The joy in her voice when you answer on the first ring, she asks how the day was. And you say, no, you first. And she goes first. Says she's been thinking about the election, the way auntie and the intercessors prayed it in, how Ruto is a professing evangelical, charismatic, has a chapel in his home, how the chief justice of the Kenyan Supreme Court said Ruto's confirmation was an act of God. Only God and your mother prioritize you lately. Your friends have entered their terminal relationships, are retreating into their homes, are adopting pets. You think of that boy who does not love you. He has replaced you with another Kenyan girl from Philly. In your new apartment, empty of furniture, full of boxes and shopping bags, you open your phone searching for food. The sushi place has low ratings and expensive food. You had tacos yesterday. Salad is risky and also too expensive. You settle on Taste of East Africa. And on the phone, you order Nyamachoma. Pronounce it correctly. And Sukumawiki. Ugali. You imagine, on the other side of the phone, a girl like you. Maybe Ethiopian. Maybe Kenyan or or Tanzanian. You'll walk into the place and they'll recognize you by your forehead, your skin, something about your ears. They'll understand why you don't speak Swahili anymore. Load you with extra samosas. Give you their numbers. Say come back anytime. In the car, you put on Afro beats. Feel your heart lift a little. There are palm trees in North Park. This is the California everyone dreams of. Mom said the climate in San Diego is as close to Kenya as as it gets without actually going home. At Taste of East Africa, the cashier is a white woman with a brown ponytail. The chef is a flustered-looking white man. You want to ask who the hell started this restaurant. But a woman, also white, arrives to pick up her order and you don't tip and leave quickly and think of the most recent man who officially doesn't love you as of last week. The salesperson at the wine shop smiles with his lips only and you look for wine from South Africa. Cringing at the Austrian colonizer wine, the French and Italian and New Zealand junk. Nothing from the continent. Looks like we can't have anything nice today. You pull yourself out of it, decide to choose a red based on the cuteness of the sticker label, but all the cute ones are expensive, so you choose an okay Italian and go home to eat standing up in your kitchen empty your furniture, and mom texts goodnight, and you think maybe you will talk to God and unpack and sleep. And that was Lisa Maloma with uh, Sunday's poem, um, Lonely. 
And I just love the way the 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 honesty and the rawness of that poem. Just a wonderful poem, Lonely by Lisa Maloma. Thanks for sharing that, Lisa. And then tomorrow's poem is going to be this. This is Janice D. Soderling, um, who we published a few times. Um, and she always has a really fun style. But she talks about um, the war in Ukraine and the situation right now, how it feels to everybody. And um, here is Tuesday's poem, a preview of what's going to appear as your poem of the day tomorrow. So let's check this out. Um, this is what Janice Soderling says about it. In winter wars, as in winter sports, weather is often a determining factor. As cold weather approaches, there is considerable speculation about the future of the war in Ukraine and Europe's ability to withstand the impending energy crisis, about Putin's next move, about which countries might choose oil over promises, about future energy sources, nuclear plants, reopening, fracking, Arctic drilling. In much of the reporting, as in private opining, the war is entertainment. George Orwell wrote a socially critical novel, Keep the Aspidestra Flying, in which the protagonist declares war on the money god, but later surrenders his ideals. So that is uh, Janice's poem, or note for the poem. And here's the poem. I'm going to read it for her because um, she wasn't able to read it. Here it is. Uh, war is a spectator sport by Janice D. Soderling. War is a spectator sport. Oh, let the ground be muddy. Oh, let the mild rains fall. It's winter in the oblast, and there's writing on the wall. But no one can interpret it, a threat or fall to all. Only Putin in his fox lair knows. And guard, advance, withdraw. Oh, may oil be delivered on bobsled or skis. Winter war, like winter sports, requires an awesome freeze. So let the ground be muddy, let the Arctic tundra thaw. Let's fly the Aspidistra now and frack one last hurrah. Bow down before the money god we've worshipped there before. Excuse me one brief minute. Someone's knocking on the door. Back now. It was that Orwell chap with pizzas, strangely grinning, turning up the heat and past the beer. What did I miss? Who's winning? And that was Janice D. Sodling's poem, War is a Spectator Sport, which will be the poem of the day tomorrow on Tuesday of Rattle.com. If you don't subscribe um, to Rattle's Daily Poem, just go to rattle.com slash, um, hey, what is it? Let me, I don't even remember. Rattle, there's uh, slash, slash uh, daily email sign up. Go to that, the daily email sign up and sign up for uh, the poem of the day by email to get that poem. Now, uh, we're going to take a quick break. Before we do, I should mention, though, that after we have um, Jesse Randall on the show, we're going to have Michael Mark as well. Um, with that wonderful chat book, visiting her in Queens is more enlightening than a month in a monastery in Tibet. Uh, Michael Mark was on Rattlecast a few, a while ago, maybe around issue episode like 100 or so. So do check out uh, that episode. But we thought we'd have a short segment just to talk about the poem, too. So we'll have Michael Mark in the second hour, but we'll be back uh, right now. In just a few moments with Jesse Randall. Uh, thanks so much. Hold tight, and I will be right back. try to remember (laughs) 
Hey, welcome back. Thanks so much for your patience. As I said, our, our guest today is Jesse Randall. Um, Jesse is the author of the poetry collection Suicide Hotline Hold Music. Um, there was an old woman injecting dreams into cows and a day in Boyland. Just great titles for all these books. Um, the last one was a finalist for the Colorado Book Award. Her newest book, Mathematics for Ladies, Poems on Women in Science, was recently published by Gold SF Saint University of London. Her poems, poetry comics, and diagram poems have appeared in Poetry, Rattle, McSweeney's, and Asimov's, and she occasionally guest edits the online magazine Snakeskin. She is curator of the special collections at Colorado College, and here she is, uh, Jesse Randall. Hey, Jesse, how you doing? Hey, Timothy Green. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, it's just my pleasure to have you. I've been a fan of your work for so long because you do so many interesting things. Um, we'll see a lot of that later, but there's so much creativity in your poetry. Um, why don't you tell us, though, about this new book you have, Mathematics for Ladies? Um, just introduce it a little bit, like let us know what it's about, and then we'll read a poem from it. How about that? Yeah. Uh, Mathematics for Ladies is a collection of poems about historical women who worked in STEM fields. Um, uh, I, can, I don't know if you can hear my cat meowing. He's decided now's the moment. Um, it is. It starts in the ancient world. It goes to modern day. I tried to mostly um, not include living women scientists just because I figure they can tell their own stories. But I wanted to. Um, I, you know, I'm a librarian, like you said, so I, I had access to all kinds of wonderful. Uh, sources. Um, and once I got going on this project, it started with, um, well, I'm going to, the poem I'm about to read about Annie Jump Cannon. And I thought it would, you know, I did not realize how big it could get. And, and every time I think I'm done, like even now, I, I keep finding out about other women that I, that I get interested in. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll talk more about that later, but I'll read um, Annie Jump Cannon from page 43 in the book, which looks like this. Um, uh, although most copies don't have this excellent <laughs> hairstyle. Wish, that would be a bonus. They should include some of those <laughs> uh, little flags and things, yeah. <laughs> uh, Annie Jump Cannon, born 1863, died 1941. Annie Jump Cannon cataloged stars. The work was painstaking. The pay was terrible. But every day for 40 years, she went to work and held the universe together. Annie Jim Cannon goes home from the lab. She can't stop seeing them, the photographs, black and white smears of stars. They look like throwaways. They look like nothing, but not to her. To her, they're clear as alphabets because she's good at what she does. Um, so Annie Jim Cannon was one of the so-called Pickering's harem women. Um, Pickering was a Harvard astronomer who hired a lot of women because, um, number one, he could pay them less. And number two, uh, they were good at this sort of detail work um, that he needed. Uh, so he had them cataloging stars. And um, I, years ago, um, I went to a talk about another one of the women in that group, Sarah Francis Whiting. And the, um, the speaker, whose name is Barbara Witten, and she was the um, first tenured woman professor at Colorado College where I worked in the physics department. Uh, you know, it's not that, it's not, it's very much in our lives that, that women broke through some of these, um, became the first one thing or another. So Barbara Witten is up there talking and she shows one of these pictures of what the women were cataloging and they really just, you know, to a non to a non-scientist, they look like just blurry nothing. They're just gray smushes. And um and Barbara Witten mentioned that even though this woman with the marvelous name of Annie Jump Cannon um, had cat she literally cataloged hundreds of thousands of stars, somewhere between a quarter million and over half a million stars. And she could still recognize them years later. Like you, you like someone would show a picture and she'd be like, oh yes, that's B536 oh, wow. or whatever it was. Um, uh, and her method for cataloging them became, um, is still in use, um, though somewhat expanded. Anyway, she, she really, um, she caught my attention. And, uh, and that's where the, the book I, th I think started, uh, but it, it blossomed um, 
when we had a man running for president who bragged about how he groped women and I was so mad and I thought, well, how do I, how do I get back at the, how will I change, you know, do something about that? I'll write a lot of poems about uh-huh. women. And that somehow that seemed like a, a good revenge. Yeah. Uh, so, so that's, that's, so, so it took a long time. To, yeah, to yeah, I, bet. I mean, I haven't heard. I, I'm a science fan, and I have not heard of most of the the, the women that you're writing about here. Um, and one thing that it was fascinating too, with, which I didn't know, was that um, the first scientist was a woman. Do you want to explain? <laughs> do you want to explain why how that is? So the word scientist did not was not in use. People were called natural philosophers. People who did what we now call science were called. Um, men of science i think is that right you you may i i i was yes. this is exactly what i was afraid of that you would that you would say yeah i read I it more recently yeah it was it remember who men of was science. The, exactly i can't yeah. remember which woman it is it's not emily du chatelet right it's somebody before um, her so there's a woman who does science and because she can't be called a man of science they um the the men who who run things and so on come up with the word scientist for her um, yeah, Mary Somerville. Mary Somerville. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Thank you for showing that I don't remember all this. <laughs> no um, there she is. So Mary Somerville is born 1780. So that's you know. So so before seven, before around 1800 ish. Um, yeah, it's men of science. So yeah. So the first. So definitely the first scientist is a woman. Um, I also have a poem in the book imagining a scientist you know like before there's even language just sort of a curious girl who who wonders about things um because we don't know who the true first mm-hmm. scientist was yeah um well let's hear another poem so we get a, a feel of the book right. what do you want to read next i am going to jump to virginia apgar on page 77 okay virginia apgar born 1909 died 1974 For the first 20 years, I numbed them, men, women, and children. Because of me, they felt nothing. For the second 20 years, they hung on my numbers, the mothers and fathers. I scored the newly born. Is my baby all right? The title of my book and the question they all had for me, desperate and panicked in the delivery room. They turned to my calculations with hope and fear in equal amounts. So much hope and so much fear, it almost capsized them. My numbers at last had weight. My name became known to every parent for at least one day. My numbers, their baby's numbers, more important than anything else in the world. So anyone who um, has, has been in the hospital, you know, with a newborn knows that there's this thing called the APGAR score. And your APGAR, the baby's APGAR score is, um, it's a quick number. I think a perfect score is 10, I I forget. Um, Anyway, it's a number and it, it, if it's not high enough, then the doctors will do things to get the baby up to a reasonable number. And the reason, so APGAR starts out as a, um, Uh, and an an anesthesiologist, Mm -hmm. which in the time when she's working as an anesthesiologist is kind of women's work. It's kind of like nurses do it. And it's not, it's not, um, it doesn't require as much schooling and so on. And so she starts out helping people with pain, making sure they're not feeling pain. But then she um, decides she wants to, you know, be a, be, go go to medical school, um, become a doctor. And she notices that over time, the, um, the number of, of fatalities of, of newborns has gone down, you know, like all these wonderful new things have made it so that less babies are dying. But the number of fatalities within the very first like couple of hours of birth has stayed steady hmm. for a couple for decades. And so she she develops this scoring system to try to um, change that. And so she's, so she's, if a baby doesn't have good color, if a baby isn't breathing, the APGAR, there's a back formation from her name that doctors use um, to, to score, do the quick score. It's like, uh, of course, now I can't remember what, what they are, but um, 
basically it's it's a way that you can go okay the um that baby's color isn't bright enough that kind of thing and so and and so more babies live and of course it, with you know the weird thing about being a brand new mom is that you're like you're you're like he he was 20 and a half centimeters you know like 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 there's all these weird that's what you report for some reason the length mm of the baby um, and, and the APGAR score became another one of these numbers, which you immediately forget, you know, mm -hmm. the in the next couple of days of sleep deprivation, but it's very important for that one, one day. Yeah, that's so interesting. And, and you've kind of already hit on the, the, I think the most fascinating aspect of the book. Um, it was slow reading for me because after every person, I wanted to go look up yep, who the yep. person was. And that because was you- my yeah, because you write in the persona, like like you would think that maybe with, I don't know how many, I mean, is it like 75 about or how 80, many biographies do you about have? About 80 women. Yeah. I mean, there's and so many. Even all the, there were so many more I could Yeah. Have, and I and have, each one is a persona poem, though, written in their voice. And then they, you don't give like their whole story. Like you give no. something from their voice that makes me want to go Google them and look at Wikipedia. Well, yeah. I'm so glad we're talking about this because this was something that um, I don't think this book would have been anywhere near, it wouldn't have worked before the internet, mm -hmm. right? Like yeah. if you had to go to the library or have some sort of like bigger book than this, that was the accompaniment, or uh -huh. it just yeah. wouldn't. But this way, my, my, my wonderful beloved cousin, Bill Stosen told me that he was doing that he did the same thing he kept he kept looking on wikipedia and then he would decide that that person was his new favorite scientist and then he <laughs> finds about and um this is my dream for the book that, that that it would just give you this little taste and you'd get curious you know that readers would would get get curious and find out more um I, i'm kind of uh I, i'm kind of giving away my my writing prompt that's going to come at the end but one of the things that that made me excited about the book was that, and sad and depressed also, is that, you know, I often was asking people, who's your favorite historical woman scientist? So I can add, add her to my project. And many people didn't, they, they could only think of Marie Curie and nobody else. And that, and that really bummed me out. And especially around the, the, the politics of the time, there were frequently, um, politicians on TV being asked for, a, you know, an important woman, so someone they admire who was a woman, and they tended to say their mothers, their wives, oh, wow. or their daughters, like people who whose importance was direct to them, like, like who, 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 what was important about these women was their relationship to, to the guy. And, um, and and that distressed me <laughs> because you know like it, if 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 I ask somebody to name some some important men in history, I'm sure that you know people can rattle them off. But speaking of rattle, but uh, but it surprised me how 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 and of course this all it always comes back to Elizabeth Blackwell, the the first woman doctor, because she was my hero when I was a kid and and. Um, you know, my friends got really sick of me always bringing Elizabeth Blackwell into every conversation. But, but um, you know, it's good to have some heroes. It's good to have some heroes, right? Mm -hmm. Like you should know, you should have people from the past that you admire. And um, and yeah, they're not all, not all the poems are written in the voice of the scientists. I should say mm -hmm. here because um, there were a few women that I felt like if I tried to speak for them, it it would be a mistake mm -hmm. um so there are some they're they're not all persona poems but mostly mostly they are and um i also got some great advice from my friend the poet uh daniel m shapiro who said you know it's it's better the poems are better when they are when there's some metaphor that's just there for the taking rather than kind of i did this and i did that and that's why i'm important i'm important like that's not that fun of a poem you could just mm -hmm. read the wikipedia page yeah for the person yeah so oh so so to your point the press gold sf um wondered if i wanted to have a lot of notes at the back about all these women mm -hmm. and i convinced them that it would be a mistake for me to kind of repeat with you know like for for me to give biographies of every woman because any, you can do that so easily. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but 
but I did include some notes that were when there were things that um, that were a little bit off the the beyond basic Wikipedia or um, the books that I read that were called bio bibliographies, which were my main sources. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's so fascinating. I mean, it works so well because I just, I, you know, I was Googling everybody as, we, <laughs> as I read through these poems because I, you know, I'd heard of a few of them, but most of them I hadn't heard of. And there seems like there's an explosion too, starting in the in the 18th century of, of yep. just women in science. And yep. um, it's just fascinating, you know, how many people I hadn't heard of. And, um, and, and I just, the, the, the way you give a sliver of it without telling the whole story just is so intriguing that every single poem makes you wonder what the rest of the story is. Well, um, my dream, of course, is that, you know, you have, you have humanities oriented kids sitting in science class and they're, you know, and the teacher gets, says like, everyone pick a poem and find out more about this person. Mm -hmm. Like that would have, that might have changed my own relationship with science, you know, like, yeah. like I had the idea that I would become a doctor because of Elizabeth Blackwell, of course, I had that idea. And then, um, you know, came frog dissection time came around and that was icky to me. And, you know, but like, it's hard to know now if I had, if, if my science teacher had been a woman, if I had heard a lot about women, you know, maybe I wouldn't have been so icked out. It was kind of like the standard thing was to be grossed out um, mm -hmm. by the smell. And the, I mean, I feel like that was objectively gross, but, but who knows yeah. if, if I, if I'd understood more, if I'd known more about women's involvement because they're often involved and then they, their names could just get wiped off the the papers and such because uh you know the the they're often the wives of of scientists and the, the male gets his name on well mm -hmm. yeah you know yeah exactly yeah. um do you want to uh, read another poem yes i do okay. i'll read one that's funny now or uh, to me it's funny okay this is honor fell from page 64. okay Anna Fell, born 1900, died 1986. That's a real name. I love that name. Honor Fell. It's true I brought an animal to my sister's wedding. It wasn't a large animal. It wasn't a loud animal. I don't see why everyone made such a fuss. Ferrets are friendly. But let's talk about cartilage and skin. Let's use the word histological. Let's leave the ferret in the past and move on to chickens and pigs, the avian knee joint, an occasional rodent. I directed the Strange Ways lab for 40 years. I earned doctor and was rewarded with Dane. My bibliography goes on for seven pages. It's not my fault you don't know this. It's not your fault. It's not the ferret's fault. Let's agree to laugh about it while we do our work. So Honor Fell was one of the most um, sort of least angry women scientists that I read about. She just loved science. She just loved it. It made her happy. Uh, she really did, you know, bring a ferret to her sister's wedding, apparently. She she just seems like um, a person that nobody could could get her down. Mm -hmm. So uh, so so what was the writing process like? I mean, you're we haven't mentioned or I guess briefly mentioned, but that you're a librarian. Um, and so I, I guess the research part comes pretty naturally to you. How did the, you know, once you, you know, find a poet that you want to write about, how, what was the process like of, of finding like their voice? Because the, so many of them are in the persona of the, of the scientists. So um, was, how did you, yeah, how did you come across and know what you want to write about without like revealing their whole backstory like we talked it about? It went the opposite way. So yeah. rather than me knowing about someone and then researching them, I, I, there were these sets of books. There are these sets of books in my library called the, you know, there are these bio bibliographies. They're great big thick books about women in various um, STEM fields. So there was one for physics and one for math and, and one for biology and so on and so forth. And I just found myself, you know, once I'd, I'd gone to one of them to look up Annie Jump Cannon, and then I just kept turning the pages and read, finding out about these other women. And there were so many women in there that I, it was, it became almost like, you know, like, probably every fourth or fifth name, something would would really feel like it could be a poem. Mm -hmm. So so it was, um, you know, it was, it was a fun, actually, it was fun for me to learn about these women. Um, and, and I really appreciate all the work that went into these bio, they were kind of like encyclopedias written by many different people. So they weren't, um, 
just one person's opinion. And then they and then they lit, they did have these incredibly long bibliographies of scientific papers. And um, I, I think I knew about those books because our former science librarian had mentioned to me, like, do ne never discard, don't withdraw these books. Like, even though they're old, they're, they were published in the 1980s. Mm -hmm. She said, you know, these books, they're checked out all the time. They're, they're not out of date because they're about women who are dead by the time the book is out. So it's not like they're going to be superseded. So, so that was part of it was just, um, just paging through those books, um, lugging them home and, uh, and like Mark, you know, like just, just having these long lists of women that, that I wanted to, to know more about. And then once, once it got revved up, I, I got so many, um, requests basically you know like I would like I go to a reading or something and say hey if you have a favorite woman scientist tell me who it is and then I would go work on work on them also mm -hmm. yeah uh, um, that's how I got Apgar for example I wouldn't I didn't realize Apgar was a woman like I only knew the Apgar uh, test I, did, I didn't didn't know anything about Apgar the person yeah yeah that's so interesting uh, let, let's hear another one Let's do Mary G. Ross on page 75. Okay. Oh, oh, and I should mention that uh, the book has illustrations by a NASA artist, um, Kristen Devona, who did the, did the images for a NASA app called Reaching Across the Stars, something like that. Um, so there was this wonderful thing where I, I um, contacted her and asked if I could, could use you know, could could we use the illustrations in the book? And she said, I don't even own them. The US government owns them. Oh. Anyone can use them for any reason. So mm -hmm. so that was a wonderful surprise. Um, but then I did ask her to do, you know, I, I, I commissioned a few more drawings so that so there could be more. All right, Mary G. Ross, born 1908, died 2008. I stumped the dummies on what's my line for six long questions. If war broke out tomorrow, would this product be useful? So many secrets. The government word is classified. Is it bigger than a Colt 44? Is it as big as a tank? The audience burst into applause when they read my placard. Designs, rocket missiles, and satellites for Lockheed aircraft. Bennett Cerf thought maybe I counted down the numbers to set the rockets off. He laughed and laughed. It was TV. No one said Native American or Indian or Cherokee. I was demure in my dark gown, dark gloves, and sparkling jewels. It was 1958. I kept my lips zipped. So Mary G. Ross, um, you know, she's she's a an engineer for Lockheed Aircraft. She's designing rocket missiles. And you know, the, so so this is one of those ones that where a Google search really pays off. Because if, if you Google Mary G. Ross, you can immediately get the YouTube of this episode of the old game show, What's My Line, where they would, um, there would be this panel of, of brainy experts asking questions of the, um, the contestant. And, um, and in this case, I mean, when you watch it from today, and 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 the idea how how shocked they are that this you know kind of glamorous looking elegant woman standing before them is is designs rocket missiles like like the idea that, that fame you know Bennett Sir famous famous literary critic Bennett Sir he's, that he would think she was the person who went ten nine eight seven six like like you know so so uh, some of these poems just make you really mad. Some yeah. of the, the women's life stories make you really mad. And um, I will say that I, I sent some of these poems off to one magazine, the editor of which returned them saying that he didn't publish rants. <laughs> yeah. hmm. uh, which, you know, I, I can see. I think they're poems. but mm -hmm. I, I don't know. I can't imagine even just giving a response to any poems. That, 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 and that's why, <laughs> I mean, to say, oh, thank you for the submission, but yeah, no, yeah, yeah like I, I, yeah, I never really like, I don't really need feedback. If yeah. you don't like them, I don't. Mm -hmm. No, that's exactly. Okay. Yeah, um, yeah, um. It, it did. It, it did strike. Like I did immediately tell everyone that I could 
that I could tell, like, here's what this editor said, you know, like, like to be that clueless, to, to think that it's okay to, as a, you know, white male editor of a, in this case, magazine that publishes mostly white male poets and um, to, to chastise me, mm -hmm. to, you know, like to slap my, Oh, speaking of slapping, oh, let's read Roberta Icke. Okay, let's do it. All right, Roberta Icke, this is page 91. Okay. Roberta Icke is still alive. She was born in 1943. At 23, I stowed away on a research vessel out of Woods Hole. I brought fruit and cookies and extra socks. I'd sleep in the bilge in the day, collect plankton in jars at night. But the bilge was dark and the engine smelly. I'd never been so seasick. I had to go up for air. The captain turned the ship around. The chief scientist put me over his knee. It's funny. It's not. You try doing science in the basement of a boat, still smarting from the boss's hand. God, yeah. so, so, she, so yeah. she stows away to do science. Like she wants to do science so badly that um that she that she hides on the ship but she can't you know she she's she, she's great at doing the science and gathering the plankton but she's not so great at you know um being down there in the bilge and this guy spanks her but he he, he puts her over his knee and hits her on the bottom in front of it can you like uh, yeah i mean she's still alive i know yeah this is not this isn't yeah. this isn't 100 years ago she was born 1934 mm -hmm. she is younger than my mother wow no, that's not true. Nope, nope. I, I did Close. the math. She's a little older. She's <laughs> yeah. she's older than my mother, uh -huh. but she's not that old. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah. and uh, yeah, yeah. And then they and then they rather than just stay out and let her do her science, they 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 waste. They turn back and they lose many days of their. Yeah, that's Roberta Ike. Yeah. Um, well, if anybody has any questions for Jesse, uh, leave them in the chat windows, either on Facebook or YouTube. Um, so is there anything that you learned uh, in the in the course of doing this research that was surprising to you? Um, I was looking at some comments here and um, Jennifer Elise Wang, who's sort of a resident scientist on the uh, the regulars that we have. I think she's a molecular biologist. Um, she says one big reason I quit my previous lab was not getting credit for my work. Yep. Um, are, are there things like that that you discovered that you didn't know going in that was surprising to you? I, I certainly did not know how, how long this, like how, how up to today it mm -hmm. was still happening. Um, I, I kind of pictured it as like in the olden days when women couldn't do science. And then it turned out to, to be very much um, a current day problem also. Uh, one of my, one of my favorite surprises. So, you know, like I said, Elizabeth Blackwell, my hero, the first woman doctor, so on. It turns out she actually isn't really the first woman doctor, or at least not, I mean, depending how you count it. So there was, there was a doctor named James Miranda Berry who was born, um, w who was, uh, what do we say now? He was, he was assigned female at birth. I, I don't know. It's very hard to know because James Miranda Berry is, um, He's, he, he, he lives way before we have the word trans, and I don't know how he thought of himself, but he becomes a doctor um, well before Elizabeth Blackwell in, um, in drag. You know, he dresses as, he, he, he gives a male name, he, he dresses as a man, he lives his whole life as a man, and, and, he, and he tries to keep that secret even beyond dying you know he said he he leaves rules like no one is to handle my dead body other than this you know designated person but the secret does come out uh so that was so that was you know all these all this time i've been i've i've said elizabeth blackwell the first woman doctor probably 400 times in my life and and not exactly maybe not not Really, I mean, there there are people who love science so much that they they'll do they'll do a lot they'll sacrifice a lot to to be able to do it. Um, so that was so that was one surprise. I was also surprised at um, how often being female actually helped um, women do science. Uh, I mean, how I mean, like like they could do it. They could they could do some things better than the men could. Um, for example. Uh, Jane Goodall um, with the apes, the, the gorillas, she probably 
could get along with those gorillas because she was female and the gorillas didn't see her as a threat. Oh, so male, so this is a case where like, can you imagine how much further ahead we would be in terms of scientific knowledge if women had been doing science all along? Like the loss to humanity is, is um, surprising and upsetting to me to think of, of all the things we could know, um, all the things we could, all the lives we could save, all the, all the um, better scientific knowledge we could have if, if we'd have the full team, you know, yeah. there, there was no reason to bench half, half the team. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, uh, Duke Westheimer asks if you have a Hedy Lamar poem. I'm looking through. I, I don't see I, it in the I table do of not. Yeah. Um, I, I have her on my list. I'm so, I'm, and I'll take, I'd love to hear if anyone has requests, but I have her on my list, but there were, I kind of made a rule that if other than Marie Curie, I was going to try to avoid the ones, the, the scientists that I felt like had already gotten enough attention. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. um, so Ada Lovelace who helped, um, to invent the computer, she just had this, th there's a big graphic novel that came out about her within the last five years. And, and so I kind of set those women aside um but i but hedy lamar i definitely she's on the she's on my list i'll get <laughs> yeah. there well that, that gets to another question though is like how did you decide who had something you know that, that demanded writing a poem versus who because there were a lot of people you mentioned so many people that, that were in these biographies how did yeah. you know who had a poem in them and who didn't what was I, the, the criteria you know, just the gut it was my own so so i actually there were so many biographies that were just kind of straightforwardly this person was really good at at science and and you know that's what she did and and that's that and um oh, i'm trying to find the poem i want to read to you god is that it it's, anyway it's it's basically it's it's my friend susie degrasse's favorite poem in the book and it basically just goes you know Leave me alone. I'm trying to do science. I, I don't I I didn't I don't want to be clever and delightful and interesting and and, and charming. I just want to do my science. Um, there, that's that's a paraphrase of the poem. <laughs> and um and there were so many women like that in the books, like mm -hmm. where and maybe it was because of the person who was writing the book, but they were just there there wasn't kind of a metaphorical grab for me. Whereas with you know Annie Jump Cannon cataloging these smears and remembering them that just seemed like something that just seemed like a, a poem you know that's just a poem mm -hmm. um often the 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 metaphors were just right there for the taking and and um irresistible you know i'm not the i'm not the hardest working poet ever i'm <laughs> i'm i'm if there's an easy way I'll, I'll take it and and that's that's how many of these women were but but there could you know there, i have a website for the book with probably 30 or 40 more. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> There's just too much. Like, just so, oh, there, like I said, I, I feel like I could do a whole other book if 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 the world um, could handle more, of the, you know, like probably I've done enough. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, they're, they're, they're so fun. They were just so fun to do. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, let's do one last one, then we'll move on to um, other work that you've done too. All right, I'll read the Marie Curie poem. Marie Curie, born 1867, died 1934. Um, what page is that? Oh, sorry. Uh, 47. Okay. 47. And here's a picture of her by um, Kristen DeBona. Stop comparing me to every woman scientist. Another Madame Curie this. A new Madame Curie that. Stop renaming women altogether. We already lost our names to marriage. We already receive unwanted nicknames from male colleagues who are far from collegial. Talk about toxic. Will the ticking of my machine ever, ever stop? So obviously, you know, Marie Curie gets poisoned by radium. So mm -hmm. that again was one of these metaphors. It's just like, Doop. yeah, you can't not have a poem uh, for, <laughs> for Marie Curie. I, I, want, I wanted to leave her out, but but it was just because she she's had she's had things enough. But, um, but uh, then I thought, well, this is the request I'm going to get. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, for sure. I mean, it's just so there's so much po poetry in that. And then we have a poem. Um, her husband, uh, what's her name? Pierre? Is it Pierre Curie? That sounds right. See, I'm glad we, we forget the husband. 
<laughs> but um, but uh, but he died being run over by a cart. We have a poem about that back in Rattle, which is just an, an amazing <laughs> part of the story. There's so much. It's just so cinematic. I can't believe there's not a, yeah, a feature there, length movie there ha- about. There has been yeah. a movie about the Curie. Has there? Um, oh, okay. I, yeah, it's. It, I might have gone straight to streaming. No, I. I. There have been se- so so. I've always wanted a. a what I really want is a musical about Elizabeth Blackwell. Oh, like, wow. That would be cool. Show, show yeah. Do you think about writing some, that? I mean, I, 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 I actually went down that road like a quarter uh-huh. mile, but you know, the time, but I, I, that's not my, I'm, that's not going to happen, but I, I, it's just, somebody should do it because there's so many great moments in her life that would make fantastic um, musical numbers. But um, uh, uh, what were we talking about? Oh, movies. Yeah. So there's, there were two separate movies recently about Mary Anning, one of them, you know, one of them clearly about her and one of them kind of um, less, less obviously so uh, with like a big lesbian love affair that's very much imaginary. Um, but there, there have been a, a few movies, but, but, and Marie Curie did get one, but it's a little slow going. It's kind of, you know, it's kind of um, history channel more than big screen, mm-hmm. but um it had a famous, it's a famous actor playing Mary Curie. Interesting. Yeah, I'd like to see that for sure. I mean, there's such a great, great story. I mean, there's so many elements are so novelistic or cinematic or whatever, yep. Um, yep. You, whichever you'd prefer. Um, before we move on, there are two questions um, from people. So um, so we mentioned Jennifer Lee Wang. She asked, um, did you have a specific criteria as to defining who was a scientist? Like whether mm-hmm. social scientists like psychology or anthropology were included mm-hmm. or if it had to be an occupation? Um, how, what was your criteria for this? I did go outside. So at first I was sticking to just um, science, technology, engineering, medicine. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then I couldn't resist having a couple of anthropologists and I even at one point had a librarian, which is really not, which is really cheating because library science is, that is. The word science is in there. So. Yeah, <laughs> okay. but, um, but in general, I stuck mm-hmm. to STEM. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, but there were times when I, there were times when I'd read about someone and get excited about them and, and look and like Google and do a little, um, what's it called? Bias, the thing where you, you confirmation bias. And I would write like, is anthropology a STEM field? And I would get like find one site that would say yes, and I would decide <laughs> yeah. that was good enough. That's funny. Um, just so I could, just mm-hmm. so I could have them. But no, there were so. I mean, you know, I, I there were so many women. I there's so many more I could have included. I just tried to the way I did it. I tried to just have sort of a variety of different kinds of of science and different lives. Like there were so many women whose lives were so similar. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, each story was unique, but how many poems can we read about somebody who's who's forbidden from this and not allowed for that and barred from getting the degree? And like it 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 was it was too hard. It was it was too hard on the heart. So I, I did try to have a mixture. Yeah. Um, and one more question. So um, CB99 videos, who is actually uh, Carla Schwartz, she asked, do you prefer to focus on the feminist aspect of being a woman in STEM Oh, are there any poems that don't touch on these themes? Uh, there are definitely are poems in there that are that are not that the femaleness of the scientist is not the focus. Um, uh, I mean, I mean, for most of these women, I would say being female was not uh, something that they were constantly thinking about, except when when people gave them trouble about mm-hmm. it. Yeah. Um, so so like so Gold SF, the publisher of the book. They are a brand new um, imprint within uh, the University of London Goldsmiths publish- Publishing House, and this is their first book. But their their s- stated purpose is to publish feminist science fiction. Oh, interesting! And so, um, and so the the manuscript started out, you know, what, as one thing, and kind of became more more definitely feminist science fiction. You know, as as we, as it got the forward and the notes and um, and all that, but but no, I I mean a lot of this, a lot of what interested me about these women was was just simply what they what they found out, what they what they learned. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm look, I'm flipping through, and there are, there are plenty of poems in here that don't don't even mention they could the the person could be male. Yeah, do you want? Do, is there anyone to read? Yeah. Nah, we've done enough of these. <laughs> okay. Well, that was a you know mathematics for ladies uh, poems. 
uh, on Women in Science, which is just out not too long ago from um, Gold SF, like we mentioned, uh, by Jesse Randall. Um, but but Jesse's been doing some really interesting work um, and other things, um, poetry, comics, and diagram poems. It's just so interesting, all the different ways that you like push out into different ways of making poems. Um, do you want to read? I don't know what, how, where to start, but is there something you want to read to show some of what you've been doing? Um, so I'm, I'm really, I love visual poems. Uh, I love poems that are, that are, uh, where, where at least some readers would say, well, I don't even see why that's a poem. Yeah. You know, I mm-hmm. like, I like prose poems. I like any, I like things that are text and image mixed together. So in my book, um, how to tell if you are human, uh, it, what these are, are poems that started out as, um, you know, illustrations in old library books. So again, the, my, my library career is definitely um, has synergy with, with, with poetry. Um, so uh, in this, like, this is, you know, the illustration is from some sort of book of games uh, and, and I added the text, yeah. uh, I love you so much. So, so you get, like, <laughs> yeah, so just, for people who just, are just listening that we image, should, uh, you so, just so this is too- alone. Yeah, so this is two uh, men, sort of boxers, you know, yeah, like like in coming barrels? out of barrels. Yeah, For kind of like, yeah, yeah, and they're kind of like fighting, but also hugging. And they say, yeah. "What is it they say again?" And they're smiling. Yeah, kind of. They really seem to be. It's and what I add, all I added was, "I love you so much," and shh, <laughs> and just like just so few words, and and yet this to me that's like to me the whole thing of poem a poem is that you get so much meaning into such a small number of words or a small space and I'm really I, I care about the shape of the poem um the, the you know the size I tend to like smaller poems and uh and you know the the first and only time that I had a poem in in, in poetry magazine it, it uh which was you know a life goal was um I literally put two words onto a diagram and it really seemed like cheating <laughs> I find it now um, it's it, it it was again one of these here disaster plan. So this again was a, an illustration showing how to play a game of some kind, which I now forget. The book gives citations for all the diagram sources, and all I put down was all I added was disaster. Plan. Hmm. Because to me, this picture kind of looked like that thing where you hide under the desk when there's a nuclear bomb and stuff, like in school, and they say, you know, drill. It's a nuclear drill. Um, uh, I mean, to, like, I I still can't believe that poetry <laughs> thought that was poetry. Um, yeah. It is, but I didn't think they would. Like, Rattle has been much more on the forefront, as far as I'm concerned, of of, of new kinds of strange poems. Um, yeah, we like to be surprising. Like, I, I like to, I mean, my goal is that every page you turn and you have no idea what's going to come next. And so yeah. when there's really strange things, like, oh, we could get that in there and, and surprise people and make it strange. Um, so so what is what is your, like, definition of a poem, then? If you love bent, blending these like, genres and, 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 like, what is it about, you mentioned condensing things into as few words as possible, but what, but what is it that makes a poem? Well, um, Timothy Green you you have asked me a stumper uh you know for me um i i don't mind a a really expansive definition of of poetry i don't have an mfa i don't teach creative writing i am a librarian who who writes poems um and for me like it's not it's a joy it's it's something i i don't have to do it like nobody's Nobody's going to deny me tenure if I don't do it right or something. Uh-huh. Yeah. So, um, so I, but I've been so inspired and, and influenced by um, writers who there's a writers who just kind of push at it. For me, a poem is it has it. I think it does need to have words. <laughs> That'll be like the bare minimum. Let's say it has to have words. Um, normally I would say as soon as something has line breaks, it, it's a poem, but of course there's prose poems and those don't have line breaks. And I don't mean that anything with line breaks is a good poem, but you know, but I think you can, you can call it a poem to me. I'm, so, so for me, like, I do like writing in forms like a sonnet or a pantoum or 
such, but it's not my, it's not my go-to it's, 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 I, I do it occasionally, but, um, for me, the diagram poems, the diagram part of the poem became like the form. So instead of having a sonnet that carries with it all this sort of historical, um, you know, there, there's, you know, readers, readers who read poems know what a sonnet is and they kind of, they're already halfway into the poem just by looking at it on the page and seeing, oh, that's gonna be a sonnet. Um, for me, it was much more interesting to start with a diagram poem, uh, a diagram, an illustration, an image of some kind. And and if you could watch me in Photoshop moving the word, you know, a little tiny bit this way and down over here and then looking at it and then moving it back up again, like like that, the visual of it. Um, I, I know many poets will say that 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 poetry is is a is a an aural that you hear it that 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 that's really the 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 gist the main thing of poetry is to hear it Homer is Iliad and such I don't really I don't that's not how I think of poems I really prefer them on the page not out loud in that image in that voice and that in, um, K Ryan talks about the like there's this voice that you hear the poem in in your mind that doesn't exist anywhere. Mm -hmm. It's not a real, it, it cannot be spoken, you know, like there's just in your mind, you're, you're, the poem is a thing. And um, I'm being really articulate about this. Aren't I? No, so, you're right. I mean, it's just, <laughs> it's fascinating. It's different. Yeah, but, it's different um, it. but, you know, like, like I just want to look, I want to look at it and, and think about it that way. And, I don't really hear a poem. I don't really get the meaning of a poem very well if I only hear it. I, mm. I like to look at it. Um, and I'll be drawn to a poem because of the shape or or um, its weirdness on the page um, more than more than anything else, really. Like if I'm flipping through rattle, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and there's and there's some poem, some poems that are like super long, uh, long columns. I'm I probably I might, but I they're they're not the first ones I'm gonna read yeah. for sure. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, do you have um, the baby hygiene series from Rattle? Because I, I could put them up and we could share that. Because I'm curious how they came to be and and just to hear you talk about 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 what they're and doing. Did you? Did I tell you about how Allison Rollins did an after poem from that poem? No, I don't know anything did about it. Did you know it. about yeah. that? No, oh I don't. Yeah. Well, I should have. I should have told you this was years ago. Uh -huh. Or not that long, but sometime during the pandemic, whatever time period that was. So. Um, so this poem first appeared in Rattle. Yeah, I'll put it up so you don't have to hold the book up. I'll put it oh, up. Good. On, okay, um, great. Yeah. So this, so awesome. So baby hygiene, nursing, and the baby's equipment. So this, so this was from this crazy book called The English Duden, and it's kind of like a dictionary, an illustrated dictionary, um, in German and English. And this book was just like amazing. So, so do you have it? Do you have it up? I'm not yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, it's up for everybody. Right? So for me, it's not, but for you, for them, it is. Yeah. But so, so I mean, obviously, just looking at this picture and the, you know, the original um, labels for all those numbered things. Um, you know, it just the, says to uh, describe it though for people who are uh, only listening sure. on the audio so version. We, this sure. is the baby we, hygiene, nursing, yeah. and baby equipment, and then there's these uh, images of you know taking care of a baby, and there's so there's one in a playpen, there's one in a changing table, uh, and all these numbered labels that that are you know apparently you know what you're supposed to do or what these things are. There's yep. two images. There's another one of a baby nursing and another baby, baby being changed. Um, so this was a two-page poem. Mm -hmm. Using two, um, you know, descriptions of these or, or labels of these diagrams, which is fascinating. So, um, so that's what we're looking at as we talk about this. And the the key, I think you would say, right? Mm -hmm. Like the thing yeah. that the mm -hmm. labels for all these numbers. Some of them make you know make total sense in the original. Um, you know the the. <laughs> Um, the under blankets, um, the nurse or the nanny. There, there's also a picture on um, number 30 is literally in the original book. I didn't change it for the poem. The mother or a wet nurse feeding the baby. So you, so there are, in these pictures, there are, um, we see four different little babies and three women. And two of the women have um, sort of a nurse nurse's cap 
on their head and the other woman is either the mother or a hired wet nurse. Mm -hmm. You know, the, 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 the illustration doesn't differentiate um, uh, and, and, and we have a little baby getting its diaper changed and there are, there are toys and, and equipment and it, it all looks, it all looks quite complicated. And then um, the number 29 is like a little clown toy <laughs> sitting on the sill. So, so what I did is, I mean, it was, I suppose, a form of erasure where I, where I took out some of the labels and changed them to things like the dreariness or um, um, the, the self-hatred uh, and, and, um, you know, things that, that I think are very much, um, important terms in, in a mother's, in a, in a new mother's, um, existence that are not exactly pictured in this picture. Um, uh, Is there so a way some of the equipment. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Is there a way that you, uh, read this or, or do you just mean it to be visual and not read? No, I, I've read it, at, I've read it, at, um, out loud and I, but I usually try to show it up on the screen at the mm -hmm. same time. So, you know, multimedia event. Yeah. Um, so I read like, uh, well, do you want to read it so we can kind of hear? Sure, I'll show how I do it. Yeah. yeah, sure. yeah. Um, so I go, um, baby hygiene, nursing and baby's equipment. One, as if knowing the names for things will make it all right. The rubber sheet, rubber square, the medicine, the dreariness, the boredom, the under blankets, the nurse, child, children's trained nurse or nanny, more medicine, the terror, the safety strap or safety belt, the pillow, the elf picture, the rubber panties, the doctor visits, the never knowing, the pap plate, a warming dish, the pusher, the enema, a rubber syringe, the self-hatred, the shame, the giving up, the folding rubber bath, the baby or suckling or little one or newborn child or infant or babe in arms. That's the first, that's the first half. So it's, it's, um, I love the mixing just sort of the, like, these are the instructions and these are the labels and here's what they are with, um, those more emotional kinds of, mm -hmm. kinds of words. Yeah. There. It's so fascinating. I'm glad to hear you read that. Cause it comes to me, I read it like a list poem, you know, like it, like I could, because I am a very, you know, auditory type, you know, listener of poetry. Mm -hmm. So to me, it's like this list poem with the, the fascinating aspect that it's also a diagram. Um, it's really cool. So how did you, how did this come to be? Did you, did you come across this in a book and then say, this needs to be a poem or? or yes. Yeah. So, okay. So my library, um, I work at Colorado College. I'm the special collections librarian there. And a few years ago, we had a big library renovation project that was happening. And the, um, the, the, our goal was to um, do a major so-called weeding project. So librarians, sometimes this is called refreshing or um, deselecting. I mean, there's, you know, the, it's a horrible thing to get rid of books. Like mm -hmm. no one, no one enjoys that. Well, I, I kind of, that's a, for another day, but um, so we had to, we knew we had to withdraw a significant number of our books or they just weren't going to fit into the new building the way the new building was being envisioned by people outside the library. So there were, there was a lot of um, dead weight in the collection. You know, you don't need seven editions of word perfect manuals, right? Like there definitely were things that didn't belong there. And many of the pre-1923 books were now fully digitized and online. And so there were all these old books being being set out on the shelf at the back of the library to go off to rural libraries and prison libraries and any library that would want them um, that we were discarding. And so every day on my way out of the building, I would just kind of like pick up some books and, and riffle through them. And the Duden book was, I mean, every single page of it was, was the, you know, that kind of, it was all in the same format where you'd have this, these illustrations across the top with a million numbers and then the labels of what everything was. And um, it was the kind of book that always appealed to me when I was a kid, uh, kind of maybe sort of like that Richard Scarry kind of like yeah. so many things happening and your eye just can um, wander, wander all over. So, so, so it was definitely the, it started with images. And often what I do then is photocopy the images that appealed to me and sort of, put them around my, my, on my wall, tape them up to the wall and sort of live with them for a while and, and see if there was something I, I wanted to do 
do further with them. Um, so, so with do with the with the baby, the one that we just read part of. So, um, a poet named Allison Rollins um, did an after poem mm -hmm. for that poem that appeared in poetry. Oh, I'll wow. have to send it to you because yeah. um, I didn't know. I was yeah. so excited that. Uh, I mean, who, like, that's like one of those goals you didn't even know you had until someone does it. It's like, someone did an after promo for me. Oh, I know. Um, yeah, that's a great feeling. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. So she, and what she did was, was she used the same illustration, but 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 a very different kind of um, textual mm -hmm. changes and additions. And then she ended up getting really into that whole book. And she's done several others from other pages in the book. So, so in the end, even though our copy of Duden had been withdrawn, we had to buy another one <laughs> and put it back into the collection because because now there's an English professor at CC who who makes who has her students use that book mm -hmm. and then my poem and Allison Rollins's poem and and go from there. Yeah, yeah, that's really cool. Um, and, and so those are the diagram poems, but then you have these comics too. Um, do you want to explain how the comics go? I have um, a Suicide Hotline Hold music right here. Sure. Would, if you if there's any you want to share in there well, why don't you show the 18 to 19 spread the poems the comics that first appeared in rattle yes um so kenneth coke uh the of the new york school of poets um he he made many 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 poetry comics i i would i would say he kind of invented at least maybe he was the first person to call them poetry comics people were doing similar kinds of things but he has a whole book of them um called the art of the possible published by soft skull uh anyway those those just really floated my boat i love i loved those poetry comics and i started trying to do some of my own um the ones that are you showing the ones from yeah put them up right, right here yeah mm -hmm. um so these so rattle was the first magazine to take any of my my poetry comics uh thrilled me to no end at that at that point, I was looking at um, I was doing kind of logic uh, Venn diagrams. So the so these are Venn diagrams showing um, things I remember, things you remember, my advice to you, and what you're actually going to do, which has no crossover in the Venn diagram. Because Lewis Carroll had this whole book of amazing logic puzzles and things um, that were like you know they were like any dry logic book except that they were fantastical so instead of saying you know the here's the the people with brown hair and people with brown eyes and they're not all this right but his would be like these are the alligators with flowered hats and these are the i mean they were just uh, they were so fun and silly and um and so that's where that one came from yeah and it's then, just so and, interesting yeah so this is uh just for people only listening this is a. Uh, a Venn diagram, so two overlapping circles here, and they overlap in this one. <laughs> it's things I remember and things you remember. And some of the things are in common, but some of the things are not. And then almost like a punchline to it is my advice to you. <laughs> um, and then completely not overlapping in a Venn diagram is what you're actually going to do, which I think, I mean, I think they kind of go together. Um, but, yes, but that cracked they, us up when we got, I remember when we got this, key. like, what is this going on? But that is funny. So we published it. <laughs> Yeah. And then, and then, and then, at that point, I think you still do this. You were asking people for audio, and so I, so I, <laughs> so I did. <laughs> you know, not even though there's so few words, and I was able to, I, I used my librarian skills to learn a new software so that I could overlap the words so that it could say um, things I remember, things you remember, but there was a slight overlap with. Oh, the, that's right. The two yeah, I forgot about that. And yeah. then the other one, it was nice and separated. That you you would laugh if you knew how long it took me to make that. <laughs> I think I use I think I I probably got help from our help desk folks and was using something called Audacity, which was a free download, and then figuring out how to overlap the. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's great. Um, yeah, I mean, people just love what you do. There's a lot of a lot of great comments here, like. Um, Awesome. Uh, like Abby, Abby Murray's here. She says, I just love Jesse's Abby work. Murray. Yeah. The oh. courage and twist and humor and precision of it. I came to heckle her because she told me I could. <laughs> <laughs> Abby Murray used to teach my yeah. daughter violin. Oh, really? Oh, that's great. Yeah. And then yep. Jesse's, uh, Muriel Class says, Jesse's poetry is unique and entertaining. Um, and it just jumps so I couldn't read it. Unique and entertaining. And um, um, it doesn't need to fit. 
Jesse is an artist. She's just, <laughs> just, it's, it's, it's true, though, that, that what you do is so creative and, and unusual. It's, it's always fun to come across. I, I do consider myself an artist, but I do not. I'm not a trained. <laughs> I mean, I can't. Uh, you know, I well, love it doesn't to matter. Know. I mean, the point of I art, cannot... you know, is to make people think differently about the world yeah. and appreciate it more. And that's what all the things you do, even if they're doodles of just Venn diagrams. Uh, doodles are another yeah. thing. I, for a while, I was trying to get people to send me their doodles, and then I was putting uh-huh. words on them and making collaborative poems out of them. Um, but uh, that I, I haven't gotten any doodles in so long that I've given up on that. Uh, well, send send Jesse doodles. Yes, I would love your doodles. Yeah. I would love it. <laughs> Um, one, one last question. So I was wondering how much this sort of genre bending thing that you do has to do with that you became a librarian. Because, you know, because cataloging and organizing things and arranging information is what librarian science is all about. And then so so finding the places where it doesn't fit and you don't know how to categorize seems like it's something that maybe I you're drawn not, to. Is that part I've of it? I've never thought of that, but that is actually, that could be. Because like, yeah, librarians, I mean, part of what we try to do is is you know classify things and make things easier to figure out and so maybe making some things that are not that are the opposite kind of goal definitely that could be um i will say i you know when i found out library science was a career i, I was a senior in college i didn't even know there was i didn't know there was a master's degree in librarianship um and i was so happy when i found that out because I had kind of pictured myself maybe trying to get an English PhD or working for peanuts in the publishing world. And, um, and neither of those seemed, but like, you know, to, to go to school and get a master's degree and then be able to be a librarian and spend all my time in libraries, which I love, um, was such a, a glorious relief um, to find out that was a career. And I think for me, um, if I were teaching students writing all day I don't know if I would want to write when I got home Mm -hmm. you know like I kind of like that to some degree I can leave my work behind at when I come home I don't have to grade papers or prep classes and um and just kind of (laughs) my my daughter likes this cat that gives the finger and says I do what I want (laughs) and then that's kind of how like that's kind of how I feel about. It. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Yes, I mean so much freedom, you know, that you you can't you can do whatever you want. Yeah. Yeah, like like what? How? You know? Yeah, just just do whatever you want. Yeah. <laughs> Well, that is call great. Poem. Call yeah. poem. See what happens and let, <laughs> let other people have that argument. Um, you know? Well, let's finish out with one last piece. I don't know what to do, though. What would you like to share as like a last thing to share? I would love to to show off my new idea. of. OK, so I don't know about you, but I have been seeing a lot of these Wordle scores mm-hmm. on, in, in social media. Yeah, so I do the Wordle what, with my kids every night. So yeah, it's like, like Wordle a, is yeah, fun. It's fun. I totally get that Wordle is fun and I like to do Wordle, but I don't understand the thing where you then share out the picture of <laughs> your score, which doesn't have any words, any letters. Like mm-hmm. it just shows the squares. Yeah, that's a fascinating um, aspect and, of it. I haven't come to terms with what that actually means. I, it's like, yeah, I, yeah. So I was getting so many of those and I, I was irked by them it just seemed like messing you know boring why is this messing up my feed of the things i care about for my friends or whatever and so i i so i made out like a watercolor of of just the squares and i said from now on if you want to share your wordle score you have to hand paint it (laughs) (laughs) like like just trying to express that i was you know the people should quit doing that um to make them stop to make it harder but then I decided that actually the Wordle scoreboard would make it would be a great poetry form. Mm -hmm. So, so now I'm making poems like the, the rule is the form is that you have to how like I'm peeking out behind it. Um, The form is it can be one to six lines and each line is one word that is five letters long. Those are the rules and Mm -hmm. you don't have, you can just write the poem, but I like to, do it in color you could use markers or crayons or whatever you have on hand i use a dime store watercolor set so amaze fling juice those are ju- that to me that's like a, a that i'd rather write that kind of a thing than a haiku yeah haiku are fun too but like they're kind of when i when you're a kid and you're forced to write haiku in school it just it's like the syllable counting and i just feel like the wordle poem could be the new the new form haiku, where you yeah. start 
it's like the bait, like when you're just becoming a poet, the fun is, okay, what can I do with this, with these rules? Five letter words. And then your brain starts filling with five letter words and you just can't stop. You can't, you just start thinking in terms of five letter words, um, green beach grass. Like those are all fantastic words and they're all five letters long and they go together. So um, are then, these, uh, you know, when you come to the green one, like thing, I have yeah. one that's thing uh, or glass in that version. Is no. that, the, was that the word of the day that day? No, the, no. no I just made these up. Yeah. I made, totally made them up. And in fact, my, my word, my, my poems that are like wordles are, are not made by people who are good at wordles because <laughs> yeah. they're not, they're not like using their clues. This, so then of course, within that, my new form, I started playing around with it, like, I don't think in Wordle you're allowed to put the same word more than once, but sometimes when people say sorry over and over, mm -hmm. what they actually are is angry. Yeah. Um, so so now so now I've even gone, I've even gone rogue on my on my own inventive form, but um, but uh, I have a, I when I told I have a my friend Aaron Kohick said that um, he he's been doing these these poems that are all four letter word not swear words but just four letter words mm -hmm. and i think he only ha can do three and then each one the letters are done in this very special and complicated way but um i think inventing a new poetry form is is um we should all try that yeah oh, I, and yeah uh -huh. I I, just, I was thinking how it would be fun to um because you could enter these as actual um, words. I'll do the one I have one you sent me ahead of time, and this is here in the PDF. It's um, apple trees aren't everything. Just a wonderful little poem, um, but you could like have two accounts, right? And you could find the word of the day, yeah. and yeah. then you could make um, make your you know, own, make your own, and then yeah. enter it and then screen cap it as if that yeah. was the actual word. That would be so yes. fun. So that is a challenge yeah. for everybody at home. You have to have two accounts, yeah. Yeah, there you go, like one on your phone, one on your computer, and then make your own Wordle yep. poem every day, which just adds orders of magnitude to how fun the Wordle would be. And then you could share those to your social media, and yeah. I would enjoy seeing them instead <laughs> exactly. of just those meaningless blobs yeah. of color. Yeah, that is so cool. Um, yeah, well, it's just been so fun talking to you, Jesse, as I thought it would be, because you do so many interesting, fun things. Um, you know, really great book. Again, we were talking about uh, Mathematics for Ladies, um, there's a poems on women in science and um, I, the other book I have here although there's a ton of books you have is that uh, this is suicide um, hotline hold music I mean the humor comes through just in the titles first of all but um, excellent work great talking to you Jesse it's been a pleasure I enjoyed it so much thank you so much for having me yeah excellent yeah thanks so much and, and take care I'll talk to you soon all right bye it was Jesse Randall. And uh, once again, those two books are uh, Suicide Hotline Hold Music, Mathematics for Ladies. Um, there are a whole bunch of books that Jesse has, though. You can find more at a tough website. It's personalwebs.coloradocollege.edu slash tilde J. Randall. And if you want to um, find it, the best thing to do is just Google Jesse Randall. That's J-E-S-S-Y. R-A-N-D-A-L-L, -L. and this website will come up. But there's so much of these diagram poems, um, so many fun things to talk about. Um, so do check out Jesse Randall's work. And, and if you were inspired by uh, Mathematics for Ladies, definitely pick up a copy of that from SF Gold. Um, now we're going to take a quick break. We'll come back with uh, another special guest. Michael Mark is here. And um, for everybody who's a subscriber, you know that there's this wonderful um, chat book, Visiting Her in Queens is More Enlightening Than a Month in a Monastery in Tibet. Um, Michael Mark was on Rattlecast around 90 or so. Um, and he's going to be back with us to talk about this new chapbook, which was one of the winners of the Rattle Chapbook Prize in just a few moments. So I will be uh, put on some bumper music and I will be right back in just a little bit. OK, so hang tight. Hey, hey my.
Yeah, and we're back from just a little break. Um, as I mentioned, this is the chat book that came to all subscribers this year. I'll just read Michael Mark's bio, although you can find a whole, you know, a whole wonderful hour with him um, back on that Rattlecast episode. Michael Mark has walked the Himalayas, Wales, Portugal, and Spain with his two children. He's the author of two collections of stories, Toba and Toba at the Hands of a Thief. He follows his wife, Lois, a travel writer around the world, but can always be found in Queens in his head. And it's just this wonderful, it's really the, the already the best-selling chapbook we've had out of all, I don't know, for up to 20 or so. Um, but just wonderful response to this chapbook. And here he is, uh, Michael Mark. Hey, Michael, how you doing? How are you, Tim? I'm great. I'm great. Thanks for having me. Thanks yeah. for the for, for picking the book. <laughs> well, it's definitely my pleasure. I mean, it was it was one of those books where we read it and then cried and then published it. You know, so it was very simple, very simple. Um, do you, <laughs> and and you know, if we look back at that rattlecast we did with you, um, I was like just trying to get you to put a, a book together. So, um, uh, first off, how did you like? Why did you know that you wanted to write about this topic about your mother and her her dealing with Alzheimer's? I don't know that I knew. I think the poems led me absolutely believe that. Um, you know, I you see someone and then they change and change and change. We all change. But she inspired me because throughout her dignity mm -hmm. was there. My mom was always there. Different voices, shapes, sounds but my mom was there and I wanted to be close to her and I wanted to see her in all those phases. So I, I, this is how I was able to receive her and celebrate her and, and share with her, I think. So I'm very pleased about having her on the, thank you for, for, for allowing the cover to be the way it is mm -hmm. because it means almost more than anything else to me to have that cover yeah and so for not people mama. you know not for people just listening um that cover is michael's own photograph of his mom mm -hmm. in her apartment in queens um drinking coffee at their kitchen table um and then the back cover of course is michael uh, himself in that same you know outside of that same kitchen um later on after she's gone very touching yeah. and just a wonderful cover i i love uh i love that you shared those personal photos for the for the book you know, I don't know how much of an imagination I have. I mean, I know these, some of the, of course, the poems I conflate with some of my hospice patients, you know, um, that I specialize in, in memory care. So they also had the same challenges that my mom had. But, um, you know, in the, in the case of the, of, of the cover, and um, it seemed to tell a story, the big, you know, the kind of the movement and, and this whole this whole book is about the changes. We think about end of life as one stage, but if you, if you're if you're sensitized to it, you'll see there are just so many many stages. Mm -hmm. Hardly stages. They blend so much. There's no you know, there's no you know boundaries. They blend so blur so much. You know. Yeah. 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 Well, do you want to uh, read one of the poems? We'll read a few, I think, before we go today. But, but what right. do you want to read first? You want me to read a few? Yeah, let's okay. read, like, maybe, maybe three we could read, probably. Okay. I'd like to start off with um, uh, page nine. Uh, my mother's disease prays to the same God as my mother. She's singing and cleaning the oven again scrubbing with detergents and steel wool without the rubber gloves to protect her shoes. My father slides a chair to watch. She calls him God, maybe because he's always telling her what to do. He reminds her to unplug the can opener before she washes it the toaster oven too, and the Mr. Coffee that's been warming two cups of decaf since midnight. She spreads the used ammonia-soaked rags over the burners to dry. He moves them to the window, opens it a little more, checks that the car is still out there. When she asks, is it good enough? He says yes. From the gold-flecked linoleum 
she calls him closer. Look what I have done for you, God. He can make a joke. God could see from anywhere, but he gets up, bends as low as she needs to believe he's judging her work, maybe her soul. Good, he says. And of course he knows because you don't have to be God to know. She'll put her head right back in the oven. Her whole body could fit now. She's that tiny. She'll start cleaning again and singing part Yiddish, part gibberish, echoing in the metal cave. What else can God do but tap his brown socked foot? Yeah, just one of the many, many beautiful poems from this collection. That was uh, My Mother's Disease, Praise to the Same God as My Mother. Uh, from visiting her in Queens is more enlightening than a month in a monastery in Tibet. And like Cindy Gore says, she says, the photos were great. I laughed and cried reading the poems. Um, they're wonderful. And that's what we felt, too. I mean, we laughed and cried, and, and it's just such a, I mean, the openness and honesty um, that just comes through in these. It's just a wonderful, you know, moving human connection that you make here. Um, and let us all experience as you write these poems. Uh, one of the things I was wondering that I never asked you about is if you, you know, your work in memory care um, and, and at the end of life in hospice, um, which we talked about um, in the um, interview that we did for Rattle, whatever that was, 71 maybe. Um, um, was that before or after your mother um, had ended up with Alzheimer's? And, and how did that help? And, and do you think that like maybe the, like you were, you did that work in order to be able to help your mother. Like, that's one of the things I was always wondering about. Given, I mean, your story, yeah. I mean, people have to look at the story about how you became a Buddhist, which is one of the most memorable things I've ever heard. Uh, but yeah. we'll leave it there as a teaser. Like, go back to that issue 71, read about yeah. that. But um, <laughs> but do you think that there's um, something something deeper to it, that, that they were connected in some way? You would ask that question. You would see that. That, that is just so Tim. Um, I never saw it that way. I, I did, you know, before my mom's diagnosis, and I was the first one to notice because of the of the years in the, in the hospice that preceded it, and uh, in, in the memory care. Um, I think I was helpful. I think the training did help. Um, I hope it did. I think it did. I, you know, I have confidence in that. Mm -hmm. um, and. So I, and because I live in California, my mom and dad were living in Queens and he did a remarkable job. My father, who I don't see as a patient man, he's not, <laughs> was so gentle and dedicated to my mother that, you know, I had some problems with my dad. He, that just, that just, just won me over. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, he, uh, you know, but he did resist the idea. I said, mom, mom seems to, uh, you know, I'm seeing these things and that was hard for him. Be and then I would go back to California. And um, so, um, but I did notice it. And then we did take her to certain places and he, neurologists and he did. And, and, I, and I accompanied him in some cases and helped best I could. And yeah. Yeah. Um, there's a question uh, from Cindy Gore, and she asks if you could share your thought process on the moon descriptions in Dad Leave Mom, which is so original, Linda? she says. And since we have a request, maybe you could read that poem and which talk about how that poem came to be, the Dad Leave Mom. Oh, Dad Leave Mom. Yeah, I got it. Yeah. Yeah, 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 sure. Sure. Oh, well, <laughs> you want me to read it? I'll read it first. Thank you, Cindy, for the request. I don't get requests. No, I ain't no famous guy here. It's all right. Huh. This is a prose poem. I guess you have it up, right, Tim? Uh -huh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Huh. Dad, leave mom while she sleeps. Tape, I'll be back on the bathroom mirror, the trash can, under the carpet's corner, where you can't believe anyone in their right mind would ever look. Take the keys, house, car, garage, mailbox. Take a red eye from JFK, business class, never in a million years, I know. Still, fly past the twice a day horse pill moon. 
cheese sandwich cut in half moon, pea stained sheets moon, doctor's blank face moon, nurse a rusty nail too, dozed. After a six hour flight, it will only be three hours later. Come to California, dad. We'll swim in the pool like you showed us at Jones Beach. Glide, glide until just before you sink, then kick hard and glide. Sit at the table, at the head of the table. Tell your grandchildren how you beat the world to its knees. Cash in the bank, neither son in jail, a wife who took a long shot with me, and a new Bonneville. You can bounce up, up from the diving board. Punch God in his heaven is better than this world face before you sink down past the full diaper moon. You're not my husband, moon. Gibberish moon, be her shadow all night in the 40 watt haze of that apartment in Queens moon. Yeah, just such a moving poem. Dad, leave mom. It's hard to, for me not to tear up hearing that one and the the honesty of it. Um, but, but to answer uh, Cindy Gore, or who was it that asked that? Was it Cindy Gore? I'm not seeing it again. Oh, it was Kashiana Singh. No, it was Cindy Gore. Yeah. So, so those descriptions of the moon. Um, and, and the way you riff on that um, was so fascinating to me as I read it too. Um, mm. How did that come to be? Like it, it feels always like you're so free to associate and jump to new things in your writing, which is one of the things that makes it magical. Um, so, so how do you come to those those moon that moon riff that you did there? Um, thank you, thank you. Uh, I, I, um, <clears throat> you know, I'm not conscious when I'm writing my best. I think. Mm. I mean, when I. After I've written something, I, like we talked about before, it's a vibration, a color, a vibration in great deal, but that I know oh, there's something here. And I look at it, I don't remember manipulating my fingers the, or the keyboard. Mm. I'm in touch or receiving. I feel like I'm just the radio receiver. I didn't write the music. I didn't sing the music. I didn't strum the music. And I didn't even put it on the record player or what have you, whatever medium, I just received it. Then I manipulate it, of course, because you know, you, you shape it. In this case, what started this was, you know, I was worried about my dad. Hmm. It's hard being a caregiver. That's really brutal. And I was watching what was happened to my father and he's a real strong man. And I watched what happened with the families who were handling, helping, you know, their family member who was going through this, and what was going on with them. So, you know, again, just using the resources, then taking what is really I felt strongly about and what you do do when you have somebody who gets lost. You do take notes on the bathroom. This is a bathroom. Mm-hmm. This is a living room. This is a chair. You, you, you help them. You give them handles. Because the world is spinning, it's blurring. Just like you said about my work, it blurs. You know, there's reality and then you, and then you think there's another reality. I would call them both realities, but others might say, well, that's, 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 that's fantasy. I don't know, I don't know. So I, I, I took these things about horse pill moon because she's taking these horse pills and dirty diapers because this is a situation, sadly, as it is. And what to do? Take the keys because you don't want her to wander. But get on that plane. Of course, you can't. So I blended what I knew to be almost you no know, foundations, and I just I recolored them. Mm-hmm. If that makes any sense? Yeah, yeah, it definitely does. And and the 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 request in that poem is such a thing, you know, that might be shameful, you know, to abandon your mother, the thought of that. Is there a way that you, like, thought about giving yourself permission to write that poem? Um, Because it's it's something that that maybe people wouldn't normally say. So so how did you approach that? Yeah, it's a hard question. I get very upset because it is, I'm hurting people. Hmm. Some of this stuff hurts. My dad, this is his life. This is my mother's life. Um, how I saw it. And um, it's not easy for him. You know, I think Sharon Olds had written many times about being what is called a family poet. There are risks involved. There are, there's a transaction involved. Um, 
And I don't always feel secure in what I'm doing. Hmm. I, I have to tell it. I have to tell what I think is the truth, but I know it's blurry, and 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 I, and, and, and I have to make it beautiful. And that, to me, is a saving grace, and that it helps people, perhaps. Mm -hmm. um, that I think my mother, because she was somebody who did support me um, so much in the in the fantasy world that I lived as a young kid, because I had some some physical issues. My hearing was impaired. My eyes, I had weak eyes. My mother never gave up on me. And I think she played with me and, and, and allowed me to, to, to believe as I played with her. My father would go play cards. I said, mom, you know, dad, play cards. And I spoke to my mother sometimes two to three hours a night on those Wednesday nights while my dad was in, play, so that she wouldn't wonder. And sometimes I pretend to be you know, somebody from AT and T, because that's what she wanted to believe that I was somebody. Do you work at the telephone company? Yes, I do, Mom. I don't call it Mom, and we talk. So, um, yeah, it's not an easy. It's not an easy answer. I'm not settled with it. I don't feel great about it, but I did it. Yeah, well, I mean, thousands of people. I really appreciate this book and, and are going to hold mm -hmm. it with them forever. I mean, it's it's just the truth of it. As the comments, I mean, you should go and read the comments after. Um, after the episode on the chat windows, but um, but people just love this book and, and they're going to hold it with them forever. It's going to mean something, and and when they go through similar experiences, it's going to help them through it too. Um, what has your your dad still alive, right? Yeah. What Called, what did yeah. he think? I has he read to, it? And, and did he have a reaction? Yeah. Well, I said to the book, mm -hmm. he's in Queens. He knew. I asked him for permission on the photographs of him because mm -hmm. you know that's reality. That's who he is. That's yeah. my dad. Yeah. He's ninety six. Mm -hmm. Um, and um, we're, he's my best friend now. I mean, of course, outside of my wife, Lois. Mm -hmm. But my father and I, we share. We're two old men now. You know? We're in that. I mean, he's 96, so he's much older. But we're in the old man category. And we talk about baseball and all that. So when I sent him the book, I had hopes. But he had called me up. He said, I read the book. Well, I knew the day before. He called. We talk every day, sometimes three times a day. And um <clears throat> And he said at one point the day before he actually made a statement, he said, you know, I know I'm an old car that I'm not supposed to be listening to, which references one of the books about him being an old car. <laughs> I said, oh, I'm in trouble. I'm in trouble. Because I don't want to listen to my dad. I'm 66 year, near, years old, nearly. And I still want to make my dad proud. Mm -hmm. I think we do. So, um, but he called me up because I read the book. I don't like it. Huh. Yeah, so that hurt, but I understand and I appreciate it and I do understand and I understand, but it's hard. Hmm. But 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 um, I think he's proud of me anyway. I, I'll live with that. I think he knows that I was good to my mom and I and I try to be good to him. So it's only a book. Yeah. Um, well, we had another request, so maybe we should finish out with another uh, poem request. Okay. Um, Kashiana Singh asked if you could uh, do dancing with my father at my son's wedding. Yeah. Yeah. Super. That's a great one. Thank you for asking for that one at this moment. I hope I wasn't so sort of downer just no, now. No, definitely not. Definitely not. Gosh, you know, on your Monday night, you got to spend your time with a guy like that. All right. <clears throat> okay, I'll tell you a little story. This never happened. This is a poem of regret. Hmm. I was flying home in the plane. Uh, after I, you know, my 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 son and daughter got married daughter-in-law got married and I, I i should have asked my dad to dance hmm. so revisionist history here so dad i know you're not watching but i love you and uh thank you dancing with my father at my son's wedding there's no room on the floor, no place he won't get bumped and I won't be able to stop his fall. So we find a corner. He's taking his hearing aids out. The band pounds its assault. I take his hand, a former boxer's hand with a father's thicker fingers. He rests his wrist on my shoulder for me to lead. I pull him closer, feel for his balance, find his eyes unsure if he sees mine. 
I nod once and gently press him backwards, then to the side. I study our black shoes, see him teaching me to spit shine, his brush punishing the heels and toes like enemies. He wobbles. I grab tight. It was just a shuffle step, a fighter's faint. He smirks, loves that I fell for it. I count out loud, shouting over the music, as if he could hear, as if this were about dancing. Yeah, beautiful poem. Dancing with my father at my son's wedding. Those are poems from Visiting Her in Queens is more enlightening than a month in a monastery in Tibet. That is the first of our Rattle Poetry Prize winners this year. Um, and if anybody is not a subscriber yet, just subscribe and you get this in the mail along with the fall issue of Rattle. Um, and it made me cry for like the 10th time probably <laughs> reading this collection, Michael. I just, you're an amazing person. I'm so grateful to get to know you and get to publish your work. Um, thanks for joining us today and, and for sharing just such heartfelt poetry um, with the world. It really, everybody appreciates it. Well, Tim, you know what you do for the poetry community is a is, is immeasurable and so we are all very grateful to you me very personally for this thank you for this gift yeah well well thank you i mean it's just it's just wonderful stuff michael and um and always a pleasure to, to see you anytime i get to thanks a lot thank you all right take care and it was michael mark and uh once again his book is visiting her in queens is more enlightening than a month in a monastery in tibet which you can pick up a copy for just six bucks. We don't even charge uh, postage. That's how, how ridiculous we are at Rattle. Um, so if you just want six bucks for this, but for 25 bucks, subscribe and get that, plus uh, four or three other chat books and four issues of Rattle. Um, you can't get a better deal in all of poetry. Um, but, but thanks to Michael Mark for being here. It's just been such a pleasure. Um, we're going to go to open lines now. And um, let me put this screen up so you'll know how to do it if you'd like to share a poem. If you don't want to share a poem, just sit tight and you can listen to some new, some more poems. But uh, for the open lines, email your poem first to open mic. That's openmic at rattle.com. And then find the show link. So I'm going to post this on both YouTube and Facebook, not Twitter because it's just too much, but, but find YouTube or Facebook to find this link. Um, and then join us if you'd like to share a poem. Email it first to open mic, openmic at rattle.com. Um, all you have to do is uh, send it there so I can show it on screen, then join over Zoom. Um, I'll get to you when it's your turn. You can read your poem. We're going to have a one poem maximum today because it's already 6.45 my time. But um, but please do share a poem. You can share poems about current events. You can share poems about the prompt. And the prompt was, we forgot to mention tomorrow's prompt or, or next week's prompt, but uh, we will do that later. Um, but the prompt for this week was to write about a bruise or a scar, internal or external. That was the prompt uh, from from last week's guest. And uh, you can also share news poems. You can share poems you're published recently and are proud of. Anything you want to share, send it to open mic at openmic at rattle.com and then find the Zoom link, which I'm about to deploy. Okay, so I will take a quick break and I will be right back in just a moment. Thanks a lot and take care. And we're back after that quick break. Thanks so much for your patience. Um, like I mentioned, the prompt for this week was to write about a bruise or a scar, internal or external. Here's my short poem for this week. This is a, um, I guess you call it maybe like a, a K. Ryanian sonnet or something. It's a very, it's a skinny sonnet. Um, 14 lines. There's some rhyme schemes, which you'll see. So um, this is bruise. Here's my poem really quickly. Um, here we go. This is Bruise. When purple, it's tender, regardless, 
the sender, and in time it will fade into green. The lighter, then lighter than air, it's almost not there. If a shade, we'd call it unseen. And that is my bruise poem um, for the prompt this week. Very quick one um, for, for a quick week. Um, but let me see what you have up next. Um, let's go first. I'm just going to go to the order, and they were uh, people appeared. Here is uh, Dick Westheimer, who's who jumped on quickly. Hey, Dick, how you doing? I'm doing well. I think there are a number of folks here before me. If you want to switch, switch oh, really? it up. Well, it's, it was the first person. I don't know. It's the first. I'm going in order across my screen. However, that works. So, um, anyway, well, what would you? What do you got for us? And and I, I should uh, tell everybody it's a one poem maximum one poem two page maximum because it's already pretty late um i will read i actually uh, sent you and open my um the open mic email one of my um poets respond poems so you can okay. dig that up yeah i have it right here Hun the hungry times and uncertain sky so so what would you uh, how, how would you like to introduce this um just it, it was about the original reporting of the liberation of Many of the cities in Ukraine was mm -hmm. sort of pretty rosy about the um, and you know the 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 good news about the liberation and you know slowly the um, horrors unfolded. It just helped me to anyway. The the poem self explanatory. I think mm -hmm. okay um, okay. So, um, the hungry times and uncertain skies in a zoom autumn brings days of light rain and cool nights. The hornbeam leaves begin to yellow and Russian man boys abandon their idling tanks and still warm MREs. They've left behind horror pits where flesh drapes off chains. In their wake are tangled graves beneath the trees and abettors who betray neighbors in exchange for grain. But now there's victory on the news wires. The headline writers tale, tease a tale of bad times gone good, of locals freed by casualty-free masters of the battle map. The clockworks of war have seemingly sprung undone from ordinary time. The hour hand runs back to when the dead were not dead. The minute hand gyres forward toward the days when the invaders' flags are cut down and the blue and yellow is raised by war-torn hands. Though to those who have remained in this ravaged town, it's the second hand, a syringe, savage and thin, that twitches back and forth, marking no time. It is a quivering fear that in the absence of the enemy retreats and takes up defensive positions inside each survivor's head. The fright looks out through dilate eyes, shifting, still primed for menace and threat. The people are stuck between a terrored past and a dubious future. All are split in two, both halved and whole, parts tethered together by a slack line of time, one part free, one captive. All they've eaten is weeds, moldered melon, apples blighted on the trees, and wormy grain. The relief of liberation is too much to digest on their near empty stomachs. These are folks free to spend no money in stores with empty shelves. They know Russians hide. Some neighbors seem too fattened and the sky might at any moment turn to fire. Yeah, another great poem as always, Dick. That was uh, The Hungry Times and Uncertain Skies. It's excellent work and, and I don't know. There's some good news, at least this week, out of Ukraine. Maybe that that there's some resistance. I guess. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, it is. It it feels obviously that there is some some progress against the invaders, but at the same time, you just see the horror that's left behind. And, yeah. Yeah. And and also the the you know the menacing man in Moscow who might just throw it all away by dropping a big one on them all. You know, it's just a, must be just a terrible feeling of uncertainty to live in, live in country there. Yeah, yeah. Well, thanks so much for sharing that, Dick. A great poem, as is, is it always is. It's always a pleasure to hear your work. Yeah. Thank, thanks. Yep. Yep. Take care. That was uh, Richard Westheimer with The Hungry Times and Uncertain Skies. Uh, let's go next to um, Audrey Friedman. Hi, everybody. Hey, Audrey. How you doing? Okay, um, 
the prompt this week was so apropos. Um, this summer, my husband needed unexpected open heart surgery. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. He's, do he's doing great. Oh, Everything good. worked out. But um, this is a poem I needed to write, and your prompt pushed me to do it. So I wrote a pantoum today, a startling thump at our grandson's sixth birthday party. Someone said they hoped it was something and not someone, maybe a present that dropped or a chair without you on it. But it was someone, not something. Now you are scarred with the center seam, a chair toppled with you on it, a sturdy vein that dissects the oak's leaf is now the scar you wear, your center seam. Before the leaf is burnished from petiole to point, the fibrous vein dissects you both. Sometimes one of the unfortunate leaves fall. Before it is burnished from petiole to point, we will drive up north together again in October. Yes, sometimes one unfortunate leaf is ripped, but the chill will prickle and pink each grateful witness. Oh, excellent, Pantoom. Thanks so much for sharing that. A startling thump at our grandson's sixth birthday by Audrey Friedman. Thanks so much, Audrey. Thank you. Yeah, take care. Um, and next up, let's go to Carla Schwartz. Hi. Can you hear me? I can. can you yeah, me? you sound great. Yeah, good to hear oh, you, good. Carla. Yeah. Nice to be here. Fantastic evening so far. And um, I wrote a prompt poem, uh, which I sent in earlier, and it's called Playing Blind Man's Bluff, I Trip on a Sprinkler and Get. Interesting. And Okay, and that's the first line, mm -hmm. <laughs> essentially. It, Another it skinny blends. one, too. We were, we were both yeah. skinny this week. <laughs> yeah, scars are skinny. Yeah, I guess um, so. <laughs> so, um, yes. Playing blind man's bluff, I trip on a sprinkler and get the cut to beat all cuts. The blade slices the flesh down to bone of hawk, all pink before the blood the shock, the dock, the stitches, 34 out in 17, the scar I wore like a badge shown off to anyone who asked or didn't, aged now, barely seen, but look close, my calf, the smooth, once gaping opening, now filled in a river of skin. Oh, that was great. I love that. Playing Blind Man's Bluff, I Tripped on a Sprinkler and Git. Um, excellent poem. I love that image at the end. That's really wonderful. Thanks so much for sharing that, Carla. Oh, thank you. Thank yeah. you. And have a good night, everybody. Yeah, yeah you too. Take care. Yeah. Yeah, that was Carla Schwartz with um, a wonderful little skinny poem there. And let's go to um, Mary Ann Ebdo. Hi, how are you? Good. How are you? So this is a poet's respond. I read a New York Times article recently about childhood poverty. And, you know, they said, thank goodness it's on the downslide. There's more, um, how do I put it? There's more uh, programs to help the children. But I've done um, social services now for the past five years. Mm -hmm. And this is kind of based on when I did my internship down in a, uh, a, um, woman's shelter it's called generational poverty in three voices mm -hmm. uh grandmother always the rebel hippie playing the cool girl smoking a J with the boys finding myself pregnant after a night's fling old-fashioned parents none too pleased kicking me out to sleep with that friend's on that friend's couch crying baby with diapers and no money making myself comfortable in the welfare line, not knowing if we could survive. Daughter, I'm the product of a one night stand, angry with this situation. No mother was ever at home, never to guide me from this wretched world. Vodka being my choice of escaping, hungry and alone, bullied at school because no family for me at home. 
hiding amongst the veil of shame, a sometimes visit from my grandparents, social workers and street friends, I guess are family, Sitting in a hospital bed, just gave birth to a daughter, waiting a call from the county assistance office, and now nowhere to go. Granddaughter. I was born shaking from alcohol withdrawal. Mom runs away from time to time, needing to escape her pain. Making sure I'm never truly alone. Grandma is more involved. She is 10 years sober. Taking me to school and soccer and ballet, Mom just sits and watches in a trance, angry and sad, probably wishing she had more of grandma than I have. At least we eat dinner together. I think life is getting slightly better together. Sometimes we are dealt cards, not of our own choosing, seeking emotional support and finding none, seeking food and shelter in this never ending line of disgust, wondering when it would be our time wondering why we did this or that. Hoping though, each generation, life will be different. Yeah, excellent. Very great poem on an important topic, generational poverty and three voices. Thanks so much for sharing that. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, yeah. That was uh, Mary Ann Abdo with Generational Poverty in Three Voices. Thanks, Mary Ann. Mm -hmm, um, you're welcome. Let's go next to um, Stephen Croft. Hey, Tim. Hey, Stephen. How you doing? I'm doing good. Um, this is a Poets Respond poem. Uh, it, uh, the article I sent in with the poem was from PBS. And I'll, to introduce it, I'll read the contributor note I sent. Yeah, sure. I'll pull this up so people can just have a look at it. Warnings about the health of our world's trees have increased, become ropolic, for each of the last several years. A new study says 11% to 16% of native U.S. trees face extinction. As one scientist says, without trees, our ecosystems are broken. There is the saying all politics are local, maybe all environmental concerns will have to become local to bring broad support for sustainable environmental practices. And at this point, the Anthropocene, we are being shaken by environmental crises everywhere. Um, so something happened to me, actually happened to me. And so this is the idea that sometimes you have to be shaken into realization. Um, this is last Sunday's fortune. Yet when I consider how still a man of the world in belt and cap I scurry through dirt and dust from time to time. My heart twinges with shame that I am not fit to be master of my pines. By Juhi, the pine trees in the courtyard. Crack, 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 firecracker sounds start, swell, pass straight through the clapboard walls, tin roof of my house, startle me off the couch. I stand scared like a deer in my living room until I catch a falling sight out the window, hear the crash, reverberant pound of heavy body. How it missed my steel wellhead set away from the house under the hundred foot pine is the miracle. This scaffold branch from 80 feet above whose rough ovals of bark I finger trace as I stare up to where its torn arm is jagged leaning against a juvenile oak, having slid down it, tearing off summer green branches. The large oval barked lateral branches hit first, snapped pine frond tassels into a broken teepee, pushed to ground on both sides of the antique forties wellhead I depend on for water, leaving a streak the color of baby food down the dark bark of the understory young oak that bends away from the 500 pounds of broken pine it suddenly supports. Now the main mast of the limb points up, a long jagged edge of its breaking like a crooked finger, like an instruction, look up. It is obvious the limb was overcome by oppressors, the woody vines I haven't cut in years on this or any of my 27 virgin pines, aged 
They were here when William Bartram visited my island. I know this because Irma pushed my 28th over the road to split a neighbor's live oak. When Crane and Chainsaw told against their damaged bodies, I kept slices of cross sections to finger the rings, mourning both losses. Now, vines heavy with stem top, leaves hang from broken branch to ground like a hippie curtain, hiding the wellhead. I realize other big limbs have fallen and I've just let them lie. Timeshares for insects, spiders, turkey tail, fungus, and occasional drumming woodpecker. Today, this pine has made me look up. At the ground I walk, the vines are beautiful, the way they twist and gnarl from soil to tree, but they are in the tree crans, crowns now, soaking up too much sun energy, shaken like the ground by this that could have cracked the wellhead, chagrined and apologetic, I get clippers and hacksaw and start around the tree. In the wet, humid heat, shirt quickly stuck to back, a few trees will be all for today. Even if he never pressed an unglamorous pine needle into his notebook, Bartram would choose glorious pines over vines too. A pine never cuts xylem water from its needles. It knows it needs them to thrive. As I saw and clipped for a moment, I put cheek to bark, apologize, thank tree and branch for the hair's breadth sparing and the snap pitch and plunge. Imagine the gift of spraying water, bare feet on cool, wet tub porcelain, even though I have been an unfit master of my pines. Wow, that's excellent. A great, uh, great, great lesson there too, because I, I could take more care of our pine trees as well. Last Sunday's fortune. Uh, wonderful poem, Stephen. Thanks so much for sharing it. Thank you. Yeah. That was Stephen Croft with Last Sunday's Fortune. Um, next up, let's go to a first-time caller. Mark Milstein is here. Hey, can you hear me? Hey, Mark. Yeah, thanks so much for joining us. So where are you calling from, first of all? New York. Ah, great. Yeah, Harry thanks Town. so much for joining. Harry Town, New York. So uh, what is it that you'd like to share? Uh, it's called Complexities of Poetry. Okay. Is there um, anything you want to say to introduce I it, or don't... you want to just jump right in? No, I'll jump right in. I'm not sure it's as profound as some of the sharing, but I hope you'll like it. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Let's hear it. The books are stacked where I placed them last, one by one, poets and poems, old and new. Some read and worn from early youth on, others newly discovered in search of latest voices, Books by masters I never got, but keep trying. Then in a moment, a shift occurs, a thin ray of light, a vibration, feeling, thought, I turn to write. I study craft to understand what the greatest poets do and did, merging meaning and language, pushing boundaries of vocabulary flowing with eloquence and textures, bringing alive more life to life. That even if God reached down and demanded I stop, just enjoy impossible comparisons keep calling me back. Sounds and rhythms, images and breath, pulses and silences reverberate in waves analogous to the universe whether good or bad, sacred or profane, high or low, every poem written, every song contains elements of greatness in some bit or fashion, beating like a heart with pulsing blood. Poetry radiates delight, wonder, amazement, wields power like atoms, shines brilliant points of light, opens up the vastness, reveals the intimacies, trembles at the terrible disaster of humanity. Sorry. Sorry. 
is such grandeur and grace and perfected flow surpassing expectations so usual in daily life at greatest the experience totality and universe my stacks of book rise higher and more high strength stretching my reach in my vision nonetheless i see myself too lifted up writing truth and beauty unique in voice and meaning striving for more falling more deeply alive to this to joy and passion truth the complexities of poetry excellent thanks so much for sharing that mark that was uh i couldn't have said it better myself that's why we're all here right now sharing poetry uh thanks so much for joining us hope you can share another poem again soon yeah yeah take care thank you yeah that was uh, mark milstein once again with uh the complexities of poetry and uh and for sure that's what it's all about so thanks for sharing that mark let's go next to um let's see let's go next to um jayanthi rangan Um, let's see. Are you there, Janthi? I can't, I can't click the unmute button. Hmm. Okay, let's go later then to, um, let, we'll, we'll circle back. Let's go to Kashiana Singh. Kashiana hasn't been on in a while. Hi, Tim. Can you hear me? I can. How are you doing tonight, Kashiana? It's been great. I'm to, doing uh, really to well. Today was outstanding. I am still choking with that last section that you had with Ma Michael. Yeah, yeah, Michael's just amazing. He really is. Yeah, um, it's thank just you a, it's an honor to be on. able to publish uh, his first book of poems, which I can't, I still can't believe he hasn't published any before. That's beautiful. Um, I sent you something just a while ago, mm -hmm. Tim. If you want to bring that up, yeah, and fruits, flowers, can... and scars. Yes, I'll jump in. It's short and sweet. Okay, um, yeah. and it's like I always say. It's these are haiku inspired. I've been trying to write uh, about the body. So your, your, <laughs> your prompt was perfect to fit, fit that theme in. Uh, here's how it goes. Fra fla fruits, flowers, and scars. Ripe watermelon, tapping aging bones for hollow sounds. Ripe watermelon, tapping aging That's bones true for hollow sounds. Wrinkled tomatoes, my skin still succumbs to your touch. Wrinkled tomatoes, my skin still succumbs to your touch. Tender coconuts, harvesting forgotten fat beneath dimpled skin. Tender coconuts, harvesting forgotten fat beneath dimpled skin, regal iris, a bandageless breast, and its purple scar. Regal iris, a bandageless breast, and its purple scar. Yeah, excellent. Thanks so much for sharing those. And a great haiku sequence, Kashian. It's great to see you again. Thank you, Tim. Always. Yeah. Bye -bye. Yeah, thanks so much. It was Kashiana Singh, and she was on she was the main guest on episode it must have been around 60. So scroll back to, to around there somewhere. And um, what's the title of her book? I can't remember. You're going to have to find it. But um, a wonderful uh, poet. Great guest. Thanks so much for, for joining in, Kashiana. Next, let's go to... Our, is um, Giante there yet? Women by the Door. Women by the Door. That's Kashiana's thing. Thanks so much, Kashiana. Yeah, that was it. Woman by the Door. Let's go to Angela Gartner next. Hi, Tim. Hey, Angela. How are you doing today? Good. Just tired. Not camera ready at all. Yeah, that's all right. Sometimes I don't feel camera ready either. And yet I'm forced <laughs> to, despite my lack of camera readiness, be on the camera. But but I'm glad that, that you have the option. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> so uh, so what do you have that you want to share? Um, I sent a poem. Um, it's called The Haiku of Grief. Uh-huh. And actually, it's it's kind of a collection of haikus from the Popo Fest, um, the Poetry uh, Postcard Fest. Mm -hmm. Oh, and cool. Yeah. yeah so How these did that are like, so you did that all through the month of uh, August, right? Yes. Well, into September because mm -hmm. I'm uh, I've had a big busy August. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
but these kind of all like kind of went together. So I put them all kind of together because I was thinking about, um, you know, my grandfather passed away. And so, it, you know, I wrote, you know, I had some different postcards and, and, um, and this, this is kind of just what came out. Um, and they all kind of came together. So I'm like, oh, I'll just put them all in one. Yeah, good idea. Okay, so this is grief or haiku, the haiku of grief. Haiku of grief. Okay. You are out of reach. The lamp you left on is dim. Sun will shine again. Don't get up from the bed. Blankets for warm and safety. Visit with family. A hole deep for one. Trade the sky for quiet night, fight for tomorrow. The nest is open wide, dust pile in the corner, six and stones break. Wrapped up in diamonds, worn at resting, missing his buttons. The flame has spread home, it hurts, the wax melts away, light another, pray. Picking a teardrop, I'm broken. Twisted in its string, an Italian waltz in heaven. Ah, oh, excellent. I love those. Thanks so much for sharing that, Angela. Thanks, Tim. Have a good night. Yeah, you too. Thanks. It was Angela Gardner with Haiku of Grief. Thanks. Thanks, Angela. Um, next up we'll go to Mike Bales. Hey. Uh, good Mike. evening. Yeah, how are you doing tonight? Uh, pretty good. I I like Michael's book. It's great. Uh, my dad died from Alzheimer's, and I wrote a book about it. And I know someone else who was oh, really? working on a piece for it. So um, my point of view in that I, is you set out to write a good book, but if you're writing about Alzheimer's, you're not just writing a good book. You're actually possibly helping a lot of people. Yeah, I think so, it's too. It's like yeah. a higher calling. Mm -hmm. um, I sent you the poem earlier. It's a scar poem. Okay. It's flying and falling. Got it. Right here. Okay. Flying and falling. I thought I could fly, running in my parents' yard, left arm outstretched like a wing. The grass is verdant green, but leaves of reds and yellow spoke of fall. My left arm caught on the bat wing of my parents' 59 Impala as I ran around it, a cut left deep, and I was surprised it didn't bleed. I thought I could dream when I was in college, when in college, that I could get a degree in social work. But all I could do was fall as my dreams shriveled and died. And my advisor told me to get to settle for any degree. And now sparrows in the cold rain hop on the ground. I thought I could fly, but now my back aches to seasons born and odd jobs as summer bleeds into fall. I thought I could love the summer I met, the summer I met, the one I met one summer who led me down winding roads as I drove her to a fraternity party in Ames. But three years later, we broke up when we realized we looked at life in different ways. And the pain of broken promises filled my heart. I thought I could live beyond the pain as through the years I sped down highways far and near, but something remained. The scar on my left arm on my arm has meshed with skin and flesh and the deepest wounds I bear inside. Yeah, excellent poem. Thanks so much for sharing that, Mike. That was Mike Thanks. Bales. Yeah, yeah. I love the turn it takes halfway through. Yeah, good stuff. Mike Bales with Flying and Falling. Thanks, Mike. Um, let's go next to... Um, let's see. Um, Jayanthi, can you, can you unmute yourself? Is it possible? Because I can't push the button to ask you to. I don't know why. Hmm. Yeah, it's just not there. Um, I, I'd, lo I'd love to go to you, Janthi, if you can unmute Janthi Rangan. But um, let's go instead to Jennifer Elise Wang. Hey, hey, Tim. Hey, Jen, how you doing tonight? I'm good. Yeah, fun show. It's great to have you, you know, a resident yeah. scientist on the, <laughs> on the line the whole time. <laughs> yeah, I was like, incidentally, I was working during that section oh, <laughs> so, <really? but> anyway, <laughs> that's um, great yeah. what are you working on uh i was just, like catching up on lab work uh -huh. a lot of like keeping track of samples and and different results 
Cool. So you sent a, uh, a recently published poem. This is a mirror. Yeah. It's just published from um, existotherwise.cc. Um, yeah, it's just a new published magazine. last weekend. So can you yeah. tell us anything about the magazine? Because I've never heard of it before. Um, I love I love new just, magazines. Yeah, this is the first issue. Mm-hmm. And uh, the whole thing is, I think it's inspired by uh, the surrealist photographer, forgetting her name, it's like Claude. Uh-huh. Um, Cahoon, Claude Cahoon. Ah, okay. And so, yeah, there's a lot of like pieces just relating to self and image. And so, and I figured this kind of tied into scar because it, it, it's an emotional scar from yeah. mm-hmm. a, a really big like friend breakup, basically, that I initially thought was okay, not a big deal. But <laughs> considering I'm still having dreams about college roommates, oh, yeah, <laughs> it for really sure. has an impact on me. Yeah. Let's hear it. Mir, go, go ahead whenever you're ready. Mirror, mirror, before I'm unmuted. What are all the lies I have told myself? I see you, you see not me, but the real you that you refuse to recognize. My faults are yours, my sins are yours, but you're never punished. You hate me, though you really despise yourself. Still, you'd rather frame me than fix yourself. Then you try to shatter me when the sight isn't to your liking. But my pieces continue to silently reflect my world of realism among the fakes, because unlike you, I never lie. Yeah, excellent. Thanks so much for sharing that, Jen. That was uh, Mirror. And again, that was from um, existotherwise.cc, a a new literary magazine. Very cool to see. I have to check more out about this. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah, very cool. Thanks. Uh, Jennifer Elise Wang. And next, we will go to uh, Brent Stauffer. Hey, Tim. Hey, Brent. How are you doing tonight? Oh, I'm doing really good. It's been a uh, a really great night with a really strong start and a strong finish and a, and excellent poems in the open mic, too. Yeah, it's been a fun uh, one all the way through. Yeah, I've been a, I'm enjoying everything. The, uh, the, um, the, uh, uh, Jenny, uh huh, yeah, Jenny, oh, Jesse, uh, Jesse Randall, Jesse, I'm yeah. sorry, yeah, Jesse. I knew it wasn't quite right. Um, yeah, her stuff was so uh, enlightening and lyrical and infuriating. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> it's a great, great combination. It is, yeah, it definitely is. Um, and I'm really glad that you uh, uh, featured your second guest because um, I, I got, I, I have his chat book. Yeah. Um, but it got put under some other books and I haven't read it yet, mm-hmm. but I'm going to open it tonight. Awesome. Yeah, after. you definitely should. It's an amazing book. Yeah. And, and, and kudos to the, whoever did the art direction on the, the cover, <laughs> because there's something about the way it's composed and the, the color choices that make it look very painterly and very much like a Vermeer painting. Mm-hmm. He had all those paintings of like, somebody facing to the left and there's a window open there that sheds some light onto what they're doing. And anyway, it, it's a lovely, uh, cover and, uh, and I, and it seems like an amazing book and I can't wait to read it. So. Very cool. Well, that's me putting the, you know, I, I kind of just do everything around good here. Job. So, so I'll take that as a compliment. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Good job. Yeah. Uh, anyway, I, I did a, uh, scar poem. Um, uh, and the the of course I wrote it today, and the um, the title is just a uh, what do you call it when you put something in there just for a minute, like a placeholder um, or something. Yes, it's just a placeholder mm-hmm. um, okay. because I think it's kind of uh, not that great. So we'll skip the title and I'll just start. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um, last night. I dreamed the scars that lace my wrists like lattice work came to life, lit from within. They spiraled and twisted themselves into bright gold words from a foreign language I used to know, older than French or German, more ancient than Latin, more familiar, almost understandable. I woke up and checked, just the same 30-year-old unreadable spider script. I can guess what they meant, of course. Some encouragement, like, this too shall pass. Or a more practical warning, like, watch out. Remember, 
Nobody fails at everything. Whatever they said, those words were beautiful in their cold fire blazing over my dreaming skin. It gladdens me to think that somewhere within somebody's trying to tell me something. <laughs> That's great. I love that. Uh, I love the blazing over my dreaming skin. Yeah, great ending. Thanks so much for sharing that, Brent. Thanks, Tim. I appreciate you. Yeah, Have a yeah. good one. Yep, take care. All right, just a couple more poets here. We have um, Barbara Taylor next. Yes, I'm here. Hey, Barbara, how are you doing tonight? Hi, okay, how are you, Tim? I'm great. It's been a good night of poetry. It really has. Yeah. Um, so I have your poem here. So is there anything you want to say about it, or you want to just jump right in? Uh, no, just jump right in. It was from the uh, from January's. Uh, yeah. January. Yeah, January's prompt. Yeah. Excellent. Prompt. The, the okay. scar, yes. bruise. Yeah. Um, yes. So, my westernmost scar. There are, of course, my obvious external scars. The four inch specimen on my right upper arm, which my mother begged the surgeon to carve on the underside. One on my left hip, only my husband sees now. The small recessed gouge in my neck, impossible to hide from anyone. Although buried deep, the scars beneath my skin resurface occasionally, like this morning at the optometry office, as I stand before the contrasting splendor of Ansel Adams, freezing in front of the Tetons and the Snake River, I comment, I've been there to the impatient ocular assistant leading me to an exam room. At that very spot, she offers a polite smile of indifference, then slight agitation as I linger before Yellowstone Falls and Moonrise, Hernandez, New Mexico. I was erased from the West, redrawn farther East, where geology is buried beneath many trees whose leaves cover my old scars once again. Uh, excellent. Yeah, I love that shift at the end, that last little triplet. Thanks so much for sharing that. That was the Westernmost Scar by uh, Barbara Taylor. Thanks so much, Barbara. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, all right. And then let's go to Joy Stahl. And then, um... hey, Joy, how are you doing tonight? All right. <laughs> I was... Obviously, I'm still in my classroom. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if that's a good sign. If you're, I don't know, Nebraska is at nine thirty. <laughs> Kansas, yeah, Kansas, uh, yeah, nine thirty. Yeah. Nine thirty, and you're still in your class. I don't know. I think maybe, hopefully, you get some overtime or something. <laughs> well, no, but uh, but admittedly, like the last hour of it, I've only been listening to rattle okay. and trying to write my poem. Well, I guess that's a good day, a good reason to, to stick around at, at, at work a little later. Yeah, because <laughs> uh, I don't have a Zoom at home. But uh, I considered writing about my toaster scar, uh -huh. but it didn't make a very good story uh, <laughs> as a poem. So okay. it's a great story for parties, though. <laughs> <laughs> interesting. Well, I, kinda, I don't know if I should ask, but, uh, but interesting. But So what did you do? <laughs> uh, I, I wrote about one of my children again. Okay. Excellent. Yeah, go ahead. Constellation. I have it ready. All right. Mama, I don't have enough scars, mused my seven-year-old son. My heart shuddered with dread, considering the ways he might devise of gaining more. He already had no sense of personal safety, no ability to gauge when he was about to flail into someone's personal space. Swallowing the trepidation in my voice, hoping I sounded nonchalant, I told him, don't worry, you'll get more, but don't be in a hurry. Shrugging off my warning, he cataloged the hairline scar from the time he ran full speed into a chain-link fence just his height. The scar on his foot from the scissors his brother dropped, point down. Years later, he would gain several scars from a light bulb which exploded when a brotherly wrestling match knocked over a bedside lamp. Still later, the unseen scars of dental surgery to remove his wisdom teeth. Between those, the lip bitten through when the bully pushed him down onto a concrete slab, chipping his tooth. My son, grown to adulthood, the constellation of his scars written on the sky of his mother's memory. 
Oh, beautiful, touching poem. Thanks so much for that. Constellation by Joey Stell. Always a pleasure, Joey. Great to see you today. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, take care. It was Joey Stahl with Constellation. And let's try one more time. If we unmute. Um, are you there? Where's the poem? Um, can you hear me? I can. There you go. Hello. How are you doing tonight? Hi. It's so nice to be here. Um, yeah, it's great and to have you. This and is it a- is... Um, um, because your name doesn't show up. It's it's um. I gotta look it up again. Let's see. Oh, Jayanti. That's right, Jayanti. Yeah, 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 yeah. Great to have you yeah. on. Thank you. Um, this is uh, this poem is called "Wounds That Argue Back." Okay, great. That's a great title. <laughs> Let's hear it. Um, an accidental fall on pointy rocks, slingshot skin. It left no bruise but a pit on my leg. More shock than pain. I oozed out at first, but then the blood flood began. I was in woody open, band-aid in sight. A search began for a medicinal plant. Um, A very ordinary, pervasive herb. Tridex. Procumbens was its formal name. Way back then, I knew, I knew it by its familiar form, a long stalk with a dimple petaled daisy. My buddy mushed its fuzzy leaves, poured the green drug in my gash. The goat screeched its thick emergency over. I saw, I sighed in a healing remedy like an open and shut case out in the field for grab, nature's health insurance card that came free of charge. It didn't give me a run around, no prescription, no medical staff. It mended the crater without a screaming siren. Today, the earth shows me its injuries the waylaid storm, the mixed up temperatures, I stand there dumbfounded without portions, without Tridex procumbens. Our world howls for emergency measures and I'm appalled by Earth's impatience. Oh, that was excellent. Thanks so much for sharing that, uh, Jayanti. It's uh, that, that Tridex procumbens. I got to look that up. That sounds fascinating. Thanks for sharing yeah, that. Yeah, it's, uh, it's something that grows in it. I've never seen it, hmm. but um, but yeah, I've never forgotten. <laughs> Very interesting, yeah. <laughs> because well, it saved my life. Yeah, I'm sure. That's amazing. Great story. Thanks for sharing that. Wounds that are you. Thanks, Jayanti. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, that was Jayanti uh, Rangan with um, uh, Wounds That Argue. Yeah, really cool poem. So I'm going to shut down Zoom now. And then, um, and if you sent a poem in for me to read, there's just not going to be time this week. Um, it's already two and a half hours into the show. And um, oh, Megan's not here, actually. So I should go make the kids dinner <laughs> really quick. She's off uh, uh, helping out with something else. So um, so I know Clayton Clark sent a poem in, and Nevadita sent a poem in, and, and a whole bunch of people, Ted, and and um, Deb Tannenbaum. So maybe we get to them later or next week. Um, if we have time, sorry for the for not being able to get to everybody this week. Uh, but it's been a great show. I mean, I love um, Jesse Randall's work. I love, of course, Michael Mark. Um, great poems on the open lines. It's been wonderful. Let's do the Saiku really quickly. The Saiku for this week. The story it was. This is from MIT. And this is the uh, the story here. Story here. Um let me get it small enough so it can actually be re- readable. This is uh, Saturn's rings tilt, or Saturn's rings and tilt could be the product of an ancient missing moon. A grazing encounter may have been smashed, may have smashed the moon to bits to form Saturn's rings. A new study suggests, and the gist here is that Saturn it's always it, it rotates on a um, um, a, an an angle that's not the same. It's twenty six degrees off of the plane of the angle of most of the planets in the solar system, which suggests some kind of gravitational pull going on. 
And they, they modeled this at the scientists at MIT and realized that a moon that used to travel around Saturn and then was sucked too close and was sort of evaporated by, by the pull of the uh, Saturn's orbit, broke apart to make the rings probably. And, um, and that explains both the way the tilt functions and the way that Saturn's rings exist, and they're so beautiful. And they estimate it to be 160 million years ago this happened. So for billions of years, Saturn had an extra moon and no ring. And then, uh, according to this model, which uh, looks pretty good, um, Saturn's ring was based on this this moon that was sucked too close and broke apart due to gravitational energy. And that is the Saiku, or the, the new story. And then the Saiku is this right here. Missing moon, the tilt of the rings in our telescope. Missing moon, the tilt of our rings in our telescope. That is the Saiku for this week, and that is the show for this week. Um, the prompt for next week, which we forgot to mention, Jesse wanted to talk about it a little bit, but we can we can use our own idea. Write a poem about a historical figure most people don't know. If you like, write the poem from that person's point of view. So write a book, write a poem like Jesse's poem in Mathematics for Ladies. That was the prompt that Jesse gave us. Also, if you want to want a, like a corollary prompt, try to write like a poetry comic. That would be interesting too, or a diagram poem, or something like that. Some kind of thing that, or a, or a um, poetal poem that uh, that Jesse had. I mean, there's a lot of options with uh, Jesse's work, but the prompt she gave us was to write a poem about a historical figure most people don't know, um, and then possibly from their point of view. So that was the prompt for Jesse Randall, um, and that is going to be the show for tonight. Next week's guest on the Rattlecast is going to be. Um, where is it? Next week's guest, Jill Kendall. Um, Jill is the author of um, several books of poetry. We've published her um, in a recent issue. Um, but she's also the author of this memoir, The Clean Daughter, a cross-continental memoir um, about her travel. She married somebody from the Netherlands. She spent years in Africa, all over the world, many fascinating stories, um, trying to branch out and make some interesting, unusual shows and having, you know, someone talk about their life story and how interesting it was. A, a cross-continental memoir is something we're going to check out. She's also got, of course, tons of poems about the experiences she's had um, in Africa and elsewhere. That is Jill Candle, of uh, The Clean Daughter, Rattlecast number 161, and the prompt, once again, to write about a historical figure most people don't know. That's going to be Rattlecast number 161, the regular time, Monday, September 26th, Uh, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. Hope to see you then. Hope you have a great weekend in the meantime, and I will talk to you later. Good night.